As uh, chair of our uh, Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability, we've reached our time to commence our, our meeting and uh, to try to keep it respectful. We'd like to try to keep things punctual and be on time. Um, my name is Robert Henderson. And I'm the, the chair of the committee. And I'd like to get to give a little bit of an update on what our committee is all about here. So the Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability is charged with matters concerning agriculture, fisheries, land, water, forest, wildlife, energy, natural resources, environment, climate change, and other such matters related to natural resources and environmental sustainability. And so today we're right up the alley of uh, environment and uh, natural resources with uh, the PEI Woodlot Association, Owners Association, uh, here to present. And a little later on we have the uh, uh, PEI Watershed Alliance. So we're uh, totally in, a, in the, the bare wick of what we're supposed to uh, be responsible for in the legislature here to make recommendations uh, to the legislature on issues to, pertaining to this particular issue, woodlot. Uh, I know for myself, I do own a woodlot. I uh, have some land that has forest on it, and it's an issue that's of somewhat importance to me, and although it's not my primary source of an income outside of, uh, of uh, being a member of the legislature, uh, I do feel that our forests are, have been somewhat underutilized and have much more potential than we're able to uh, uh, get currently out of it. So it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty good topic. So I'll also remind all the committee members, so that once again, uh, to go through the chair, the same with our Woodlot Association. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, audio and uh, video here, and sometimes they get a bit confused <coughs> at who the individual is that's speaking, so, uh, so just remind people of that. Uh, so I'm going to start off by introducing uh, the PEI Woodlot Owners Association. We do have uh, Barry Murray, who's a project manager. We have Thomas Baglow, the chairperson of the committee, and Watson Hempel, a longtime forester and the advocate for the forestry at Prince Edward Island. So, I'm going to turn it over to you to make your presentation, and, and once again, you'll introduce yourself so we can get the mic for the right person, and, uh, and then uh, make your presentation, and we'll have some questions. Uh, I guess we didn't adopt the agenda yet either, so I guess that's the first thing we should probably have done, so I apologize on that. So I'd like to have an adoption of the agenda where we have two presenters, new business, and an adjournment. Uh, I'll move for adoption, noting that there's uh, one of the presenters is has filled in replacing okay. Kathy Stewart, so thank you. Okay, okay, so our, uh, um, we have a movement of our adoption of our agenda. So, okay, so I'll hand it over to the PEI Woodlot Owners Association. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Thomas Baglow. Uh, I was elected as chair of the Woodlot Association this past, I guess, April at our annual general meeting. Um, and uh, I guess my background, so I've been a board member since I bought my woodlot in 2020. Um, I, uh, I'm a forester. I operate a company called Eastern Forest Solutions, and, and I work both on PEI and, and beyond um, off Prince Edward Island in, in the forest sector and, and the, carbon, the carbon economy. Um, and I can introduce her, let Watson introduce himself. Hi, Weinstein Hempel. I'm uh, retired, <laughs> or trying to. Uh, I still do a lot of uh, work in uh, forestry. I, I even operate a chainsaw, yeah. you know, on a regular basis. So, uh, and I do forest consulting as well, and write management plans and things like that. So, yeah, I live in Cove Head, and I have a 100-acre woodlot, which is uh, has some damage in it that I'm trying to clean up. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Barry. Yeah, Barry Murray. Um, I live in Seaview, north of Kensington. Uh, I uh, fished lobsters and I grew mussels for over 20 years. And uh, I've also been uh, a, a watershed uh, executive director for Kensington North. I was a board member on this um, Woodlot Owners Association and have re resigned as a board member and now am a staff person. So I'm working part time for the association as project manager. Okay. It's okay. You can start your yeah. presentation. And, and also to add, so we're a pretty, pretty uh, supportive group of people. So we've got Doug Millington, our secretary, who, uh, Robert, you own a woodlot. Yeah, yeah. You should join the group and read our newsletters. And we've got Kathy Stewart, our past chair, um, attending as mm -hmm. well. I don't think there's anyone else that showed up. Oh. And, and Judy Shaw, who represents us with the Federation of Agriculture. Oh, good. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I'm going to give a quick little uh, kind of writing, and then we'll go through our PowerPoint, um, and then 
we'll talk a little bit about the impact of Hurricane Fiona, want, wants and will lead that conversation, um, how that's impacted with lot owners. Um, and just before I say that, so we were kind of told to talk about the state of the forest and, and we kind of represent the state of the forest from the woodlot owner's perspective. And, and whereas 90% of land on PEI is owned by private woodlot owners, they've, they've obviously been quite, uh, quite um, impacted by you know, both Hurricane Fiona and, and uh, our Western friends, more so Hurricane Dio, uh, Dorian back in 2018 or 19. Um, so on behalf of the members of the PEI Woodlot Owners Association, we wish to thank the members of the Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability for this opportunity to discuss the state of the forest on PEI. The Prince Edward Island Woodlot Owners Association was founded in 2012, unifying the prede predecessor local forestry groups across the province and providing a voice for the more than 10,000 private woodlot owners on Prince Edward Island. And I, I like to read, but I also just like to add in kind of my own comments as I move along. So I, I think the way you can think of us, and I'd classify ourselves as a, kind of a large tent organization that, that strives to represent the interests of, of all, all woodlot owners on PEI, no matter what they're kind of driven by and the reason they own their land. Um, the PEIWA is a nonprofit, member-driven, province-wide organization that holds board seats on the PEI Federation of Agriculture and the Canadian Forest Owners. So I think um, John Arthur Ramsey represents yes. us on the Federation of Forest Owners, and, and they, they kind of represent woodlot owners and forest owners um, across the country, mostly with matters related to the federal government. The PEIWA represents, board, represents private woodlot owners to government and industry, seeking resources for them to manage woodlot sustainably. PEI's forestry contact, context, which you'll hear a lot about, is influenced by hurricane Fiona damage. I would say 75% of our conversations um, are related to that at this point. I think that's probably a good estimate. We talk about it a lot. Uh, climate change, which we talk about a lot as well, and that's inter interwoven into all of our conversations. A shortage of silviculture workers, and silviculture workers are the people that help to grow forests plant trees, tend trees so that forests grow um, for the future. Uh, loss of markets for softwood and, uh, and worries about invasive species. So softwood um, forest product markets are generally what drive the forest economy of PEI. Um, we have strong fuel wood markets on the island which is generally for hardwood but softwood is really what drives landowner returns on the island at this stage. And that's to mention only a few problems and things that we talk about. So against this backdrop, the PEIWA supports good stewardship, safety, woodlot management, education, and best practices, and continues to lobby and advocate with the provincial government, as we're trying to do here today, to support the growth of the forest and woodlot sector, fund its acclaimed forestry enhancement program, and lead or promote further evolving initiatives. There's much to contemplate and do to ma maintain and increase the health of PEI forests. The income that woodlot owners earn from their woodlots, the contribution that our woodlots make to forest ecosystems, the enjoyment and recreational um, experience for people, and the beauty that woodlots contribute to our province are some of the benefits that we receive from our forests. I'd say that's a pretty limited, limited list, and um, in, the, in, the, in the interest of time, I won't read through everything that forests provide for, for the island and beyond. The aftermath of Hurricane Fiona influences all of the current issues we face as a member-driven organization. The price for saw logs and chipwood was low prior to Fiona, um, and Pro Fiona has pushed prices down to levels not seen since the 1990s. The demand for contractors, so um, when I talked about silviculture workers, they're the people that help to grow the forest at the early stage. The contractors are the people that help to get the wood out of woodlots, so they've got the timber harvesting machines or or they use other means to harvest and, and extract wood for sale. Um, and the demand for those contractors to respond, respond in a timely fashion um, to this essentially you know, drying out resource um, is becoming challenged. The demand for trees to enhance damaged woodlots far exceeds the current supply from provincial and private woodlot nurseries. We'll talk about that a little bit in some of our um, suggestions and or recommendations, however you want to take them. Um, but. Uh, that there needs to be some expansion of that um, in terms of both numbers and the diversity of species. The disaster resistance distributed by the Red Cross did not recognize woodlot owners um, on Prince Edward Island. And Watson, again, will touch on this a little bit, but um, we think that you know, the impact to private woodlot owners um, would probably be some of the largest across some sectors on the island. 
Um, pristine woodlots that were models of both production and conservation were set back <laughs> by decades. So the anguish experienced by Fiona affected woodlot owners is difficult for others to imagine. Um, we were noted, noticed about this meeting, kind of, um, you know, short notice for us, a group of volunteers that moved forward, but we did send out an email to our membership asking for them to provide some short statements <coughs> about, about the, the impact of woodlots for them, and, and we can share those. I won't read through them all right now, but we've got some really interesting take-backs from our general membership. But really, I'd like to touch through and talk about a few things. So as I said, you know, um, Fiona really hit back a lot of woodlots, um, depending on your perspective, and each woodlot owner has a different perspective. But whatever reason a landowner owns it for, it's a very long-term investment. Um, a few other things that we're going to talk about is the building code and some of our desires there and how we think that could help kickstart kind of a local forest economy. <clears throat> and, and again, I'm going to let I'm going to let Watson talk before we move into the PowerPoint presentation. I'm just going through my notes here. We have a lot of interest in talking about the nursery and and the the mixture of species that are are grown in that nursery, <coughs> and um, you know how the WA could support the province in, in knowing what you know wants to be planted or, or needs to be planted um, into the future. And then regarding the state of our forest, um, you know, we're very interested to see um, the 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 a release of a report related to the state of the forest so we come at it from the perspective of woodlot owners um but there's there's provincial provincial resources put into understanding that and and obviously it's changed in the last couple of years so we're interested to hear about that as well um and then we are following closely the work of the forestry commission so that's chaired by jp or jean paul arsenault and he um they put out a report about uh biomass sustainability um, and so we're we're very supportive generally of that of that release of that report and and interested in seeing the ideas that come out of the forestry commission in the next two years be taken seriously by the minister and by government at large and the public sector so once and I'll pass it over to you hmm. okay. awesome. thank you <coughs> um, as you may remember we were here a year ago October 20th and um, at that time, we uh, shortly after Fiona, and we were, you know, making the plea, I guess, for money to help us clean up the, the work, and then the subsequent uh, emergency task fund was uh, made some recommendations, which I was happy to do it beyond. And uh, it was a salvage uh, cut was part of the uh, package, uh, and so I guess what's happened since then is what I want to sort of talk about, yes. and. <coughs> Excuse me. As, as you know, the minister had publicly said that uh, 32,000 hectares of, of uh, PEI forest were uh, knocked down, or, or top knocked off, or leaning, and whatever, and damaged severely. And that works out with 78,000 acres. And if you permit me to sort of work in acres, because a lot of people still work in acres as opposed to hectares, and uh, in cords as opposed to cubic meters. You, know, even though we're, you have permission you know, to do cakes and cords. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> if, if you permit me to, to speak in cords uh, and, and uh, acres, uh, is a, is to, and I'm going to use sort of round figures, which uh, I believe are, are, or we believe are conservative figures, so we'll stay on the, on the low side, but it's still uh, to try to give you a, a handle on mm. where we think the economic uh, losses are and, and the rationales for them. So if we take, uh, let's say, 78,000, let's say 80,000 acres, which is uh, it's a little bit more than 78, uh, and we assume 50% uh, of that is merchantable softwood volume. And that's, I think that's a conservative estimate because if you've seen the pictures. They're, yeah. they're, they're available online. And in some places, you know, White spruce is really everything is on the ground. Everything, like you know, even from even Robson's Island, 100% mm. <laughs> on the ground. It's just you know. So in private lands, it's the same thing. And the further you go east, uh, at the worse it worse it was on PEI. <coughs> so uh, there was some real devastation in softwood. So, but we're I'm using a conservative estimate of 50% of softwood. So that would uh, bring us down to. Um, 40,000 uh, 4, acres were, uh, sorry, uh, 40,000 acres were uh, of soft merchantable wood, right? So 
before Fiona, uh, there was a thing called stumpage. And I'm not, is everyone familiar with the word stumpage? It's the price that is paid to the woodlot owner by the contractor for the volume of wood that is harvested. It's called stumpage. And if the price, the average price on PEI before Fiona was $50 a cord for stud wood. Uh, pulp was varied, but depending on markets, it was somewhere around 15, but uh, depending on markets, and then went to nothing. <laughs> so yeah. uh, let's say, but sticking with this with stud wood only, which is, uh, stud wood is, everyone knows what that is, it's two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights, and so forth, the building materials. Mm. So, and that's what the mills want. And a spruce, you know, is the best softwood. There's no question about it. it it's, you know, it, it's the biggest, best lumber. Uh, black spruce and, and white spruce both, and red spruce if we had enough of it. So, uh, but that's what everybody wants. But ball, it will take some balsa fir. It's not quite as good a quality, but it's, uh, it's still some of that too. But it is a, a lot of it damage as well. So, if we continue on the, uh, the economics, uh, at $50 a cord, and we're assuming, and again, I'm making a lot of assumptions here, but I'm hoping that I'm, I'm on the conservative side of it, at say 20 cords per acre. And uh, that's a that's a uh, provincial sort of a provincial average that we use of of uh, merchantable material, uh, and I've seen I've seen forty cords the acre, and uh, mm. you know it's beautiful, <laughs> but I've also seen fifteen so and thirty so uh, just twenty I think is a good average of twenty cords merchantable cords per acre, and that if you multiply that by fifty that's like a thousand dollars an acre of stumpage right. So again, if you multiply the uh, 40,000 uh, out by that, 40,000 acres, right? Mm -hmm. Then you end up with four, uh, 40 million dollars right. of uh, economic value loss to woodlot owners of merchantable materials. So it's a it's a it's a big hit, you know, <coughs> and it. Not really many people know that, uh, that, I, I, that I'm aware of. So, uh, but I'm just using these, again, conservative figures. So, uh, after Fiona, uh, the Emergency Task Force, we recommended a, a salvage fee, among, among other things, and uh, that, was, that has been uh, working along, uh, you know, quite well uh, for, for some people, I guess, or for more than mm -hmm. some than others. So, um, and it ranged from about two, uh, depending on the severity of the blowdown, from 25% to 75% or greater, from 250 to, to 850 uh, at the high end. Of, of course, if you have 75% blowdown, you, you're eligible for that. But I guess the, the, the problem was that the contractors, the forest contractors, and these are the people that do the work in the forest, and in PEI, we don't do a lot of our own work in the forest. I like uh, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, and there's, there's historical reasons for that. Uh, but anyway, uh, so even after Friona, it's even harder to do work in your forest because of access and the, the danger of hanging trees and leaning trees and the lack of small forestry equipment on PEI, um, you know, other than tractors, and tractors are okay, but they're not really suitable uh, for, for driving over a uh, brush. So, um, the contractors have, and I, I, gotta, I gotta make a little bit of an excuse for them. Before you jump to the conclusion that they're getting rich, uh, they're not, but they, their economic activity affects us directly because they, you know, they're working their woodlots. So uh, they have a loss of productivity in the forest and somewhere uh, you know, I'm told that the loss of productivity is somewhere in the 50% in the range of, of the, the wood that they could previously harvest per hour based and with a machine. And these are these big machines are very efficient, but they're and they're very safe. But they they have to you know now crawl over things and a lot of materials they cut. Uh, they have to move out of the way because they're not merchantable. For example, you know uh, poplar and white birch and and uh, you know a lot of other species, and some of the, the red maple can be used for firewood, but some of that has to be moved out of the way. So they have to, you know, it takes extra time to do that. So there's lots of productivity, and then uh, they 
the big softwood markets in the, where we sell our, most of our lumber off island, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. And Irving is one big player, and I don't want to pick on Irving, but I'm just saying that they, they are a big player, as well as some other big mills over there. Uh, and with the glut, and you know, anytime there was a glut in a market, and there was a lot of glut here, the prices decline, right? Uh, now, it's interesting that the prices for studwood <coughs> declined at the big mills substantially, but the price of two by fours coming out the other end increased, yeah. almost doubled in some cases. Now it's, you know, so we know very well if you get <laughs> a, a, a raw material for a lower price and you sell finished material for a higher price, is, there's a certainly a profit to be made there. Mm -hmm. But anyway, <coughs> I'm, not, I'm not criticizing them because they have their business to do. Uh, the pulpwood markets went to pieces with the closure of the Picto uh, mill there, so we couldn't sell pulpwood. And although it had to be left on the ground, and although it's great for biodiversity, with the, with the amount of, of uh, wood, more woody material to leave in the ground, the better it is for biodiversity, it's still an economic loss. And I'm not counting that in the mm -hmm. 40 million. So, uh, but the contractors, it's a loss to them because that was, they have to cut it anyway. It's the top of the tree for a lot of cases, the small trees. So they have to, they can't do anything with it. So they just have to cut it and limit it and put it in the ground. So uh, it's, a, it's a loss to them as well. Then the trucking rates, with the price of diesel, okay. the trucking rates went crazy. So, uh, you know, I'm told if there was a, it was hundred dollars a cord to move a, 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 a truckload of wood, 18 cords, to uh, Sussex and Old Brunswick. So it's a it's it's a it's a big expense, and uh, that to the to contractors, and of course that affects their bottom line and affects our bottom line. So uh, they they now the, the other problem is that the mills and their wisdom decide to pay by weight by the ton instead of by the cord. And as we know, the wood dries out. And you know, a normal healthy spruce tree is, a log is about 50% moisture, using round figures. Uh, when it dries out, it can, it can go, you know, it can go down to 20%. So that, when you're getting paid by the ton, and getting the truck, the truckers still charge the same amount because it's volume, uh, it's a significant loss. Okay, and I'm, the re there's a reason I'm getting into all these economics of contractors, uh, that, so, uh, you know, it, it's kind of, you know, the price just this week went up uh, $10 a cord, but it, it's really, uh, the trucking went up uh, uh, like $6. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's really a devastating. So now, coming back to the woodlot owners and, and the Fiona and Savage salvage fee, uh, the, the salvage fee, the, the contractors, the big contractors, would say, well, I can't pay you any stumpage for your wood because it's such a mess and, I'm, I, and for the reasons I just mentioned, not only that, but I, think I want that government salvage fee as well to help me clean up. It'll, it, it, because my bottom line, I just can't, I can't do your wood lot if I don't have that salvage fee. And sometimes it was 250 a hectare, which is a lot of ground, or sometimes it was as high as uh, you know 850, but they they a lot of them wanted it. Some you know there were there was a series of negotiations with landowners, and in some cases uh, that I'm aware of, 100% uh, of the fee went plus no no stoppage or free wood. So that uh, you know has you know another loss to contract to woodland owners. So you know on top of <laughs> On top of not being making money from wood, we we lose any any incentive money as well. So now that brings us to the present day, and we've heard and from reliable sources that the money is all used up for the salvage uh, program. It, it's there's, there's a little bit left for the people that are already in the system and have their claims in, uh, but if, for the most part, I think, and I'm not sure how much it was because the, your department knows that. You know, maybe it was a million dollars. I don't know. We can use that as a round figure if you want. But it it was good. It was great, and it helped clean up a lot of woodlots. It didn't go directly to the woodlot owners, but uh, it just wasn't enough. And we 
uh, have reason to believe that if there was, you know, 78,000 acres of damage, we have reason to believe that the salvage money only cleaned up a small fraction of that. In other words, there's a huge fraction, you know, depending, and you get, again, the department got the numbers. We, I don't have the numbers. They, you know, how much was uh, cleaned up and how many hectares was cleaned up and they know the cost and they know the money. So you can find that out quite easily. Uh, but anyway, I don't have the numbers, but we believe that a small fraction of the forest and PEI has been cleaned up. And, and, and again, I don't have the numbers as to what it was or where it was, so it, uh, you know, department does. So that, you know, is a, where, we're, where we're at today. So uh, what I'm going to have to say is that uh, we need more money to clean up. We need, we need more money to clean up the rest of the, of, uh, the owner, the, you know, the large percentage of the area, and, and, and particularly on small woodlots, uh, because uh, uh, big contractors, it costs money to move machinery, and they, it's easier to cut a large block than it is a small block. And a lot of small woodlots, you know, haven't been really, you know, sort of, you know, been able to buy, haven't been viable, let's say, right? So. That's, that's the end of my presentation, but I'm open to questions on it, and uh, thank you. Okay, well, so now you said you open to questions. So as, as chair oh. of the group, do you, do you want to all present, or is that is the no, end of your present, well, I'll, I'll presentation? Segue, I'll and then we'll very quickly through our little PowerPoint. It's got some nice pictures. Yeah, yeah, I then, think that probably would, and then we'll go yeah, to questions. Absolutely, if that yeah, suits yeah. you. <laughs> Thanks, Watson. And uh, okay. back to uh, so Thomas. this is this is what we're talking about here. These are the these are some <laughs> photographs of, of what's occurred, and this is actually you know probably the one the one on the right there is not too bad. Um, the one on the left, I've been in woodlots that that you know her, half the wood was already down from Hurricane Dorian, and now now the other bit is down. So if that's not cleaned up, you'll never be able to get in there to thin it in the next 50 to 60 years to do anything. So the next woodlot owner that takes over the stewardship of that property um, would have trouble to to really to really you know achieve anything. Um, and and I wouldn't say that we're promoting that every single acre needs cleaned up. Um, However, we do we do believe that there's a lot of benefits to that, and it would be it would be um, you know critical to expand upon that program. So I don't know if we were asked for recommendations, but we brought some. We like um, so <laughs> um, that the provincial and federal governments work with the PEI Woodlot Owners Association to refine the definition of a commercial woodlot operation um, with some applicability to Prince Edward Island, and this concern goes back to some of the the Red Cross distribution of funds and the, you know, it's hard to recognize uh, woodlot owners' losses where they haven't generated revenues and, and we understand where that comes from. However, we talked, I tried to touch on previously that it's a very long-term investment. So, um, and so we think that this business sector needs to be looked at a little bit more, more in depth um, and we, we'd love to be a part of that conversation. Recommendation two, so the, I don't know what the square footage of this, of this building is, but our second, I don't know if that's yours, Barry, or? It's a, it's a local wood, okay. local woodlot owner, a member, yep. members, yeah. And, and so our second recommendation is that the government of PEI immediately adjusts the building code according to the recommendation of the PEI Emergency Forestry Task Force. Um, so actually in preparation for this, I actually read the minister's mandate letter last night and um, it does explicitly state uh, to work on adopting the, the recommendations of the emergency task force. So we're, this, that's to the Minister of Environment and this specific recommendation I think touches on another department, um, but uh, that, this was done in New Brunswick, um, so there is room for um, interprovincial variation on that building code. And I, I have the number here, we can talk about that if you have any questions about it in terms of square footage. Diversity, diversity of species and seedlings. So I think there's some white pine, some cedar, and probably some hardwood there in the back um, in that photograph. So really our recommendation is that the provincial government recognize the demand from woodlot owners and invest in growing more tree species at the, at the J. Frank Cadet Tree Nursery um, or through contracts with other nurseries already equipped to grow other desired species. Um, so there might be some specialty species um, or different species that the province is, is not interested in expanding upon, but to allow some flexibility within the forest enhancement program to for woodlot owners to source seedlings that they can't get at the provincial <coughs> nursery. 
Um, <clears throat> so forest inventory, forest enhancement program, and silviculture, this will move to our fifth or fourth recommendation, is that the province review the incentives for participating in the forest enhancement program and increase them if they are not sufficient for attracting woodlot owners in practicing sustainable forest management and that the province follow the recommendations <coughs> of the Forestry Commission that is currently reviewing these programs and others. <clears throat> And I think this is a nice photograph. So again, we're using kind of outdated information. This is from 2010, but this shows you the extent of forests across across the province. Um, you know, you can you can tell the white areas are are non-forested, and the green are are the kind of the forested areas as per 2020 or 2010. Excuse me. Um, so as woodlot owners, um, we have a lot of interest in seeing the province. Um, um, what Robert said is that he thinks it's an underutilized or underconsidered resource. Um, the forestry division, um, when I looked at that <coughs> mandate letter, I saw very little conversation or touching on, on consideration of the forest sector. And we think of the forest sector as people involved in conservation, people involved in harvesting, tending, um, the owners of the land. And really, any, any thought about the forest sector um, it starts with the land, and, and the land is owned owned by private woodlot owners that we strive to represent. So um, we believe that the province should work with the private sector and other organizations, such as ourselves, uh, to grow the forest economy on PEI by focusing on sustainability, economic viability, and diversification. And I mean that in a number of ways. So, you know, you heard about our reliance on off-island markets and some, some ways we see some opportunity to, to uh, bring that home to the island. And as I said, woodlot owners are the foundation of the island forest economy, and we rely on a healthy forest sector to support sustainable forest management. So um, sorry we went over, I think we had 15 minutes there, but to give our presentation, but that's kind of it for us. Well, the chair will certainly give you lots of latitude there this, on this particular subject. So, okay, now we're opening it up to questions. Uh, we'll start with Peter Baker and uh, start off, Peter. Thank you, uh, Robert. Uh, thank you all for being here today and your supporting crew in the gallery. Uh, I'm going to start out by, um, you gave some pretty alarming figures there once and you paint a pretty bleak picture, to be honest, for folks who own woodlots here on Prince Edward Island. And one, we ha there are many, many unknowns here. Uh, and one is the actual, num actual number of acres that have the, where the deadfall is. You said the minister has estimated that at you gave a generous 80,000 uh, acres. 78, uh, right. no, 32,000 hectares. Hectares. 78,000 acres. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that a number <coughs> you can verify? Do we have any other estimates of how much acreage well, is there? Uh, there is, uh, photographs have been taken uh, uh, of, of uh, the Fiona damage, and the department has those. Uh, they're not sharing them, but we, we have them. And uh, from the... Uh, satellite imagery, you're able to tell, you know, the volumes from that. Right. Verify. You'll be able to verify within a range of, of uh, the amount of damage. Right. Peter Baffin Baker. Thank you. Yeah, and, and therein lies one of the big problems. I mean, all of your financial estimates and everything else are based on the assumption that the minister is giving us the, the, the accurate yes, information. That's right. No reason to think he's not, yes. but it would be really nice to yeah. have that. We uh, don't know. Yeah. We don't know. We're not, as well, we're not able to know that. Yeah. Department knows all. Right. So. Peter Bevenbaker. Thanks, Chair. Uh, we know that the state of the forest report, you mentioned that, I think Thomas mentioned that in, uh, in your comments, was due in 2020. It's a 10-year report and we're still waiting for it in 2023. Having said that, the diff obviously we're in a very different place now than we were in 2020 had it been released on time as, as we hoped it would be. Do you have any sense, you saw the 2010 photograph right at the very end or the map at the very end of the, the amount of forested land on Prince Edward Island. I remember asking the minister in the house here uh, last year, I believe, on his estimates of how much we have lost. This was before Fiona and I think he came back with 40%, I think, was of, of losses of the, of the forest from, 20, from 2010. Do you have any sense yourselves, like do you speak as an organization, can you again verify that figure or is it is it guesswork that we're using here? Uh, no, the, the answer is when, no, we don't. 
And the department has those numbers, but we don't have access to that kind of data. Uh, so, you know, we have our own woodlots and our own, from what we've seen, uh, we think it's a fair estimate, but uh, we don't have the actual data to back that up. No, that, if the minister says 40%, well, you know, he may be in, I think it's a ballpark. Do you have a follow-up question? I have another person on the list. Uh, yeah, okay. Just uh, on on that, I mean, we've we've watched uh, property values okay. here on Prince Edward Island, whether it's land or um, housing, skyrocket over the last few years. But I'm imagining the opposite is true for those who own uh, woodland. Uh, has the has Fiona impacted the the value per acre of woodlots here on Prince Edward Island, and if so, what is the what is the going rate now compared to a year ago, for example, two years yeah. ago? Want the value, value per acre? Uh, well, see, the woodlots, it, it, as, as um, Thomas said, it's a long-term investment. It, it takes 40 years, 40 <laughs> to 50 years, to grow spruce trees to merchant size. In the meantime, we're paying property taxes all those 40, 50 years. You know, and, and, uh, so uh, we, we had hoped, you know, woodlots always hope that at some point, them or their kids or their grandkids will, will be able to sell some wood and make some money. But it, with the, I guess, climate change on Fiona, and I'm not blaming anyone, but the, the, the damage uh, to woodlots has been severe, and so that means there's no income to woodlot owners. And that in itself, uh, and there would be for a number of years on, some, on a lot of woodlots, uh, the, the on-damaged trees will eventually, you know, get to a, a size, but the, the damaged trees will, will never, you know, unless they're cleaned up now, will never do it. So it may be another 40 years in some woodlots. So in, the, in that sense, the value of the growing stock, right, if I can call, call that, the growing trees impacts the value of the woodlot. So, yeah, I, I would say there is some loss, and again, I don't know, I think it varies from woodlot to woodlot, and uh, depending even on location, hmm. you know, some some uh, properties in other areas are paying you know lower property taxes than others. So it, it there is a variation in value. Okay, Susie Dillon. Uh, I just have a, a couple of questions on the softwood uh, market on PEI. I, I'm assuming that the more we have, the, the less the price is. So if there's a whole bunch of softwood that has been harvested and being up to be sold, then the price is dictated by that, or is it a standard price all the time? I'm just wondering, um, my question is going to be, uh, before Fiona, has there ever been a time when there has been um, an increase of softwood market and does that dictate the price? So if there's a whole bunch in the market, does that dictate whether the price is high or low for the person that's selling? Uh, Sorry, I don't understand. Want, uh, I, I think, I think speak it- Speak a little louder, please. I'd probably argue, uh, Susie, that it's, it's probably, it, the industry has always been based on supply and demand. Yes. It's a commodity like many other commodities. Right. So then my question yeah. would be, before Fiona, was there ever times where the, the uh, harvesting of softwood um, was less than what you would have liked it to be been because there was so much in the market? Okay. Or was oh, that only because oh, okay. of Fiona? Okay, want some helpful? Sorry, the volume of softwood uh, yeah. you may have been less than before Fiona, is that what you're saying? Was there, yeah, was there periods of time yeah, before well, Fiona yeah. where there was a lot in the market and therefore... Yeah, well, again, uh, PEI is different than Nova Scotia Brunswick because the woodland owners don't do a lot of their own work and con we're dependent on contractors. So uh, contractors, <clears throat> you know, there's only, you know, there's not a lot of contractors. There's, there's let's say, 10 big ones and, and a, a bunch of small ones, and that's it, uh, to do all this work. And uh, they just cannot do uh, everything that needs to be done or in the, and they can't, you know, the trucks are limited, it's a limited number of trucks to get the wood to the market and, you know, there's a lot of limitations on that. So yes, we'd, some woodlots, I guess, would, would uh, have liked to have uh, been harvested, but it weren't. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, again, I don't know the numbers. Uh, this, I'll intervene just a bit in saying that I know from my own perspective in trying to get a contractor to come in, you, you'd probably be at least two years to get a contractor to come in to do it before Fiona. Yeah. 
to, to get your you know to try to get some uh, work done on your on your woodlot. So it, it, it there certainly uh, is a backlog, and and the reason why, from my estimation, why you don't have as many uh, contractors is that. There's just not quite enough work, and, and if, so if I have uh, 25 or 30 acres of woodland, as an example, I could not justify buying any amount of equipment. I, you know, I have a chainsaw on a tractor, and you know, I, I get my own wood out and do some things around that side of it, so I, I couldn't justify a harvester and, and, and the yeah. porters to t haul it all out and things of that nature. So it's a, it's a big investment. They're big machines. So yeah. Susie Dillon? We just we cleared a lot in Stanhope, and we had a hard time trying to find somebody to buy the wood that we, yeah, which right. is why I'm asking. Yeah. <laughs> we had a hard time trying to find somebody to buy the wood from us uh, at that time because everybody said that they had enough and didn't need any more and had nowhere really to put it. So, yeah. um, well, speaking the, the, the big machineries, uh, you know, the processors, cost more than half a million dollars, and a forwarder or porters as uh, Robert said cost another half a million dollars. So you get a million dollars in just two pieces of equipment in the woods. Uh, and the trucking, some of the trucks are independent, some are not. So there's, you know, that's another, another four or 500,000 there. So it's a lot of money that the contractors have to make payments on, you know, at the bank. Uh, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Brad Trivers, uh, next question. Um, well, thank you, Chair, and, and thanks for your presentation. Uh, you've done a lot of work. and. Uh, provide a lot of stats and, and documentation. I really appreciate that, the clear recommendations as well. I wanted to talk about recommendation number two, if you don't mind going there. Uh, we had a, a, a motion on the floor here in the legislature. Uh, Ole Hammerland had brought it forward yes. talking about this and the ability to, uh, to use locally harvested wood and uh, that didn't have to be stamped and it didn't have to be killed dry and everything. The chair accused me of changing my mind more than I changed my underwear, but uh, I, I'm firmly in the camp of that we should be able to to use locally harvested wood and, and we should remove the limitations as much as we can. So during the, the election, and thank you for your, for your uh, as, I, as I build up to this chair, during the election I was knocking on doors, there was uh, down on Grand Park Point Road, there was a, a young man, the Beach family, that said he'd worked in New Brunswick and he brought up this regulation about 625 um, square square feet and unless didn't re have to follow the building codes and he thought it was a great idea and I'm glad to see you bring that up I'd begun some research to do a private members bill on this um, but I, I guess um, my question is uh, do you have any experience with this outside of the province and have you heard any feedback on it we frankly had a hard time finding a lot of information about it even even looking for the legislation and regulations that were surrounding it if i may uh, yeah. barry barry uh, murray yes thank you um the building code uh, permits uh, provinces to uh, fine-tune the national building code permits provinces to fine-tune it to their own jurisdictions and um there is a, a difference in the definition of uh, what may be built with unstamped lumber uh, uh, in the various provinces. Uh, on PEI, uh, it, 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 uh, the private landowner can only build, I think it's 200 square feet, which is a pretty small building, 10 by 20. It's not big enough to park a car and it's not big enough to be a, be a garage. Um, the exception to that is if you're involved in the resource industry. So a, a farmer, Fisher. a fisherman, and a, a, a forest owner is permitted to create, uh, to build a structure greater than that 200 square feet. Uh, uh, and, and, it, and it would be permitted under the code. Uh, the difference in, for New Brunswick is that uh, the, instead of 200, it's like 600 square feet. Or 625, in that range, in that range, uh, which is a substantial difference. It, it, it's the difference between a car, a building too small to park a, a small car in, to being uh, uh, an ample building for uh, storage or uh, or etc. Uh, so um, uh, it, it, during this period, when there is a surplus of uh, lumber. When prices of lumber are, are low, there's lots of lumber and lo saw logs available, uh, and there's saw logs going to waste right now as well that 
um, small independent sawyers with uh, mobile gear or small saw gears could uh, be sawing and selling lumber for construction of these larger buildings were being blocked uh, by, by the legality of the, of the building code. And this has other implications as well. Um, the embodied energy in uh, stamped lumber or, or you know, regulated lumber is huge. Uh, the, 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 the energy required to... Uh, um, embodied energy is the, all the energy it requires to create this final product. So if we compare rough lumber to stamped lumber, uh, uh, stamped lumber is kiln dried. St stamped lumber goes across to most of it, it comes back, is transported across and tra transported back again. We heard Watson quote a hundred dollars a cord. Uh, it, 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 basically, the, the the greenhouse gas cost of st stamped lumber is enormous compared to locally sawn rough lumber. So. Uh, uh, there's many good reasons why we are in favor of a, of a, a revisit to the uh, uh, minimum size or maximum size for, for stamped lumber, Just for the building code. Uh, Thomas uh, Beglow. Um, so Barry, Barry's 100% right on all of that. I just want to add a few points. So this goes back partially, I'll touch on Susan's um, question as well too. Um, the softwood markets are driven by, uh, I think the term's an oligopoly on the mainland, essentially. There's, it's, a, it's a monopoly with multiple buyers, and, and so the buyers of the wood, they kind of set the price that send, sell the final product. So the, the contractors that Watson talks about, they all, they're all selling wood to the same people, so it's just all their margins of what they're willing to pay the woodlot owner and their trucking expenses and salaries and everything that they need to... to, um, to uh, to have on top of that so the 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 question about whether there's been a time when there wasn't the prices for softwood lumber wasn't good before um before fiona like there's been many times and and even as the price goes up so i think during fiona <coughs> um a cost of uh eastern spruce pine for per thousand board feet of lumber was like 16 to 1700 dollars per thousand Whereas usually it sits at three to four hundred dollars per thousand, and stumpage prices it didn't move. So we're complaining like every other primary pro producer that the prices don't get passed on to us uh, producing the product, um, and it's just the reality. So, so touching on on the softwood lumber um, issue and the stamp lumber issue and the building code is it, the more demand, and even if it's a small local demand that can help with that, and the more that we can control that on the island, the better it would be. Um, and I'd like to actually, so there are a few mills, um, uh, Craig Wood Products, Bruce Craig, who, who's a member of our association, and I believe the Arsenal is in both in Western PEI, and there might be some others, are producing stamp lumber on PEI, and we're very supportive of that. Um, my understanding um, is that it's still very challenging to compete against the large producers in that market, and so us as the Woodlot Association, we are contemplating how we can kind of promote the use of local wood products, and that's some some project work we're looking to, to delve into in the next in the next year or two. Um, but uh, you know that that expansion of the softwood lumber or the the building square footage allot allotment would be huge, and it's the New Brunswick Federation of Woodlot Owners that that really pushed that in New Brunswick. So we can try and talk with them to see where that is written in legislation or regulations to help you with that. We can try and get some information. Okay, uh, Watson, Hempel. Yeah, uh, can I just make one clarification there? And uh, uh, my understanding, you know, I may be wrong, is that only farmers and fishermen are exempted uh, from this uh, requirement uh, for for the maximum size. Yeah, every every woodlot owner is not exempt. Okay, yeah. well, my understanding was final farmers and fishers definitely are. It could be maybe resource-based, so maybe foresters for maybe people a shop or something. But, industry. Yeah. Uh, but I did want to clarify just one thing was uh, Betsa Sawmill does have Betsa, a stamp. Yes, yes, yeah. I forgot about them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the largest Thank sawmill you. on the island yeah, yeah, yeah. in my district, uh, yeah, and absolutely. they uh, do sell stamp lumber. And uh, uh, they used to have a stamp, and then wasn't much value in it mm -hmm. at one point, and they let it go, and then now they've got it back. And uh, right, Thank you, Robert. Delivered, so just to correct that. Uh, Brad, you had a follow-up question, yeah. and then we'll go to Hilton. Just as a follow-up on that, so um, 
So I, I, I took down a bunch of uh, large birch that were end of life. Thank goodness I did before Fiona. And I had uh, Jeremy Wine from Backwoods Tree Cutting. He came in and he, he milled them up for me. I got 400 board feet. It was, it was great for a reasonable cost. Um, I guess my question to you is, should we be leaning towards more expanding the, the, the enterprise on PEI that can produce stamp lumber? Or do you think uh, there's a, an opportunity to grow the number of our small independent people that are, are producing the, the unstamped? You know, I, like I have my <coughs> boards, you know, drying in my, my garage or have for the last couple of years. Which, which is uh, the best way to go or is there room for both? Uh, Wants and handful? Uh, yeah, uh, well, I, I think there is a real opportunity. Uh, they have the small bands on males, uh, and there have been quite a number, and I don't have that number, have come to PEI uh, since, <laughs> since Fiona and, and even before that. Uh, so they are, you know, able to, able to produce lumber, and if, uh, if they were, the size was increased, I suggest to you that that number of sawmills, would, saw, band sawmills would increase as well because of supply and demand uh, issue, right? Because that's the way it works. Uh, so they are able to sell, and you can look on, you know, Facebook Marketplace, all, and they're able to sell now, you know, their, their lumber uh, on stamped uh, for small, very small buildings, uh, and sometimes it's full size. Two by four, two by four, or sometimes it's an inch and a half by three and a half, which is a plain size. But they, uh, you know, they're able to to sell their wood, and they're able to uh, the the more bands on mills there are, of course, the competition would bring the price down a little, even a little lower, I believe. So, uh, but the the more we don't have a lot of portable bands on mills. So, you know, for example, uh, I. On my own woodlot, and I've been going to use mine. I have, you know, two cords of beautiful white pine logs. I can't sell them. I have two cords of beautiful 12 foot white spruce. Can't sell it because the minimum size is eight cords for a, a truck, a 10 wheeler, to come and pick them up, or 18 cords for a tractor trailer. So, uh, though a lot of woodlot owners don't have the eight cords. It, you know, they only have little small piles, so that's where the beauty of a traveling bandsaw, a mill, uh, to come and mill it up for a reasonable price uh, would, would be helpful. But again, if we had more bandsaws, I think we'd have more traveling bandsaws. Hmm. Okay, and Barry Murray? Uh, do you want to speak to Just to sum up, uh, uh, the increase in the minimum size would uh, utilize wood uh, more efficiently on PEI, there would be more wood used. Uh, it would be uh, a, a positive greenhouse gas uh, um, uh, conclusion, and it would also create jobs. It would also create uh, aid to aid our economy. So there's a uh, it's a win 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 by raising this uh, minimum size. Okay, Thomas, you want to? Oh. That's fine. Okay, okay, uh, Hilton. Um. Thanks, Chair. Um, just wondering, uh, given the extreme weather that we happen to have, see more and more, is there any recommendations um, that you would have to or government supports to address that, um, you know, the risks that we have for the forest? Is there anything we can do or uh, work on? Um, so we heard earlier about uh, uh, we heard earlier about um, rumors that the forest enhancement program is essentially um, you know short on funds, and that's because of increased demand, new landowners, more contractors working inside of the program. Um, I, I think I think more investment into sustainable forest management, so growth of that program is going to be required. Um, We've done a really good job. We've planted trees historically, you know, going back to the 70s and 80s, we really started those programs. Um, we need to tend those forests. So forests that are planted to, to grow for a reason, we need to thin them at the right times. Um, we need to do everything we can, you know, use the best available science and, and help woodlot owners um, make the right decisions and how to lower those risks. So um, I would say 
that that would be my biggest recommendation is continued support of the forest enhancement program and or whatever changes come out of the forestry commission as that as that group kind of makes some recommendations for adjustments in that but i think there'll need to be more investment into into growing sustainable forests um and and uh yeah so that program is an asset and um and you know every woodlot owner takes a different type of risk um so there's there's woodlot owners that will just have a single species forest and thin it and hope it doesn't blow down in that 40 years and there's woodlot owners that will diversify that forest and if one species of tree has a higher risk of blowing down then there are, they'll have more species in there so it, every woodlot owner will make different decisions but but um we we need to support them in that i guess is our conclusion hilton thanks chair um is there any education or courses out there for woodlot owners as you say is cleaning up uh, mm. thinning out the forest is there any support for woodlot owners to do that yes yeah, so so we strive to do education <laughs> we, like uh, we our representation education and there's one other of our three three kind of core themes that we try to strive for but we believe arming woodlot owners with knowledge is one of our main main objectives as the woodlot association um and beyond that so the the forest enhancement program has pri private land technicians that work for the province and they bring knowledge to the landowner on how to interact within the programs and then there's private sector consultants that help the landowner navigate you know <coughs> what they should do in their woodlot what contractor would work for their goals and objectives so um, highly trained professionals I'd say will be will be important um, and then knowledge for general woodlot owners there's there's good models of courses from the Nova Scotia government um, that have kind of self-training that you can do but um, so education for woodlot owners we'd love to yeah. see more extension services um, um, for landowners as well as um, as well as continued support again of of, of the forest enhancement program with which is which starts out with a management plan that brings the knowledge to the landowner on what they should do or could do. Barry Murray. Um, par partly to answer your question, uh, our association currently is sponsoring a series of woodlot walks and, and tours. And we've had two very good ones here recently where we've discussed uh, Fiona damage and how, what, um, what management techniques woodlot owners can apply to their woodlot to uh, uh, especially increase biodiversity, this particular theme, but it also is just uh, preparing for uh, future climatic conditions. Yeah. The management techniques that woodlot owners can perform to enhance their woodlot to prepare for such weather events there. Okay. Um, and there's another I... one coming up at Wanson on, on November the 4th. <laughs> Before I go to Peter Bevan Baker, I had a couple of questions, or at least I'm going to go with one right now anyway, uh, that I wanted to ask, and, it, it's, and especially I see our watershed committees are here now, is that uh, the wetland maps. So just give some experience that I had. Uh, so I have a contractor in and we're cutting trees, and it pulls up on the map, oh, can't cut there, but I can cut here. Can't really see much difference between one or the other, uh, why you can cut in this one spot. So uh, those spots then eventually blew down. So I got all this twisted mess of trees. And then yet I've got other sections where I couldn't drive a tractor on. It's quite wet, not on the wetland map. What's your indications of how accurate the wetland maps are? And is this a fair? Uh, and how did this get allocated that that's wet and that's not? And uh, is it uh, fair to the forestry industry? I would argue that pro that land probably is an agricultural land, but it's certainly not wetland. It's not bulrushes, it's not marsh grass, it's trees. Now they might be a little smaller, maybe, I don't know, but uh, they're still, you can't see the difference. They burnt, that whole area burnt by the fire in 1960, but today they are marketable trees that are now blown down. So can you give me in what your views are on the wetland? Because I asked the contractor, he says, you can't tell the difference and we go by the map because we don't want fines and I don't want fines either. Yeah. Uh, do you want me to... Uh, yeah, you know, want some helpful? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, again, I, you know, I don't have the <laughs> information that, that we, we have to refer, I guess, to the experts uh, to delineate wetlands uh, on behalf of, of uh, everyone, because wetlands are very valuable, 
uh, for biodiversity and, and for wildlife and for, you know, for all kinds of non-human creatures. Uh, so, but at the same time, they, they, they are based on a definition of a wetland. And they had their, and I think they're available, their definitions are available, uh, whether it has standing water uh, at a certain, for a certain period of time for a certain time of the year. And with, you know, with our, a lot of rains we have in, a, in, a, in April and in May, that a lot of those areas will fit that definition if they are, you know, flooded for that particular time. Or, let's say, beavers. We have a lot of beavers that are active in PEI. Uh, and they uh, will also create a wetland by making dams of the, of the small streams. So there is various ways of, of uh, defining the wetlands and uh, it, access to them. Uh, can be difficult. Uh, there are winches available, uh, winches for farm tractors and also for uh, for machines that win have winches on them, uh, skidders. So there are various machines available. And in the uh, Fiona Task Force, uh, if, if you remember uh, the Emergency Task Force, remember that we had a a, uh, a recommendation uh, that. Uh, by being careful, there was some provision for contractors to go in within a certain range of down trees in a wetland and, and get them out. Uh, and they couldn't go on directly onto the wetland, but they could go close to it and be able to reach them either with a skitters or with uh, long, long equipment that they can get. So there is some provision, uh, leniency, I guess, say, uh, under the Fiona task force there to, to be able to, and there was a separate sheet on, on guidelines uh, for uh, operating equipment uh, in, in wet areas. So, and there was, you know, there, there was some leniency there given. I don't know if I answered the question or not. Well, I guess my only point, and I'm going to go bury it next to one way in on this, but uh, I don't think there would be any damage one way or the other, any different from the line that says that that's dry land to the, the line that says that that's a wetland. Like, there, there, there wouldn't be any damage. And, and like I say, now, now I'm stuck with trying to get, get them out with a tractor, right? But, uh, um, but still, there's no damage. There's nobody getting stuck. There's no mess. There's no, it, it's just a case where the map, in my opinion, is inaccurate. And, uh, and then yet I've got an area that I would say that is wetland, uh, that uh, I could, uh, that, that I would say it's wetland, but on the map it's not wetland. You know, you couldn't get at it with a tractor. Yeah. You couldn't get at it with a machine. So I just uh, anyway. So I just that's just want some clarification. But Barry, maybe you can uh, weigh in on that. Well, um, Watson and I both have worked with watershed groups in the past and uh, are familiar with the, the the legislation and the impacts of uh, of. Uh, uh, designated buffer zones on on the, the mm. land use, and um, I think it comes down to uh, we're, we're a very densely populated populated province, and there's pressures on every acre for for more production or etc. And there will always be a discussion uh, on whether a, a, a designated land buffer zone is appropriate or not. However, uh, personally, I favor uh, the, the regulated buffer zone because of the enormous benefit that it does for uh, um, uh, hab habitat, for, for, for wildlife. So if we err, uh, hopefully we err for once <laughs> on the side of uh, uh, other forms of wildlife. So. Thomas, and then we go to Peter Baffin Baker. I don't have too much. I think some other jurisdictions have a process to, like, ground truth that um, if it is incorrect, like, it is just a mapping. So, yeah, that's all I have to add mm, okay. um, to that. Yeah. Okay, Peter Baffin Baker. I can appreciate your question, Chair. And this has been a really, really important and informative discussion. Thank you, all of you, for the contributions. I'd like to talk a little bit, because uh, once you said early on, we need more money. That was... It's pretty blunt to ask from from you, and a, and a perfectly justifiable and reasonable one, given what you've told us this morning. Um, I continue to field calls. You mentioned about the disaster financial assistance plans that are out there, whether it was the original one or the forest enhancement plan, or just this morning we had the Hurricane Fiona Forestry Recovery Plan announced for woodlot owners, or no, 
not even woodlot owners, um, property owners between one and two and a half acres because they were excluded from the forestry enhancement plan. None of this is of benefit to you. Um, one of you mentioned that you you think the money has run out for the plans that the Red Cross is administering. I suspect you're right. Um, it's been an absolute nightmare. And I look around the room here, uh, we have the large majority of MLAs who are present today represent rural districts, and I suspect that you too have dealt with constituents who are tearing their hair out, trying to understand the parameters of these programs. The, there seem to be shifting requirements all of the time, and they've greatly reduced the maximum amount that, that people were eligible for. So I, I don't know what the figures are. And I, even this morning, I, on my way in, I had a conversation with a constituent about about uh, eligibility. So it's still, it's still, things are shifting, and we don't know where they are. But what we do know is that folks like you are not eligible for any of these programs, um, at least to a, 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 a certain extent. And one question I have is, you mentioned I think once in the salvage costs per acre to go in and clean up. An, an acre. And I understand it will be different depending on the topography, the number of trees, the type of trees, the how many leaning, you know, uh, all of that stuff. I get that. But what, what would be, in your mind, a reasonable cost, salvage cost, to clear an acre of land that has been damaged by fuel? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. <laughs> I don't, and I don't really uh, have Lots the, of helpful. Uh, the sorry, sorry, Rob. Um, I don't have the exact cost because it varies so much uh, from woodlot to woodlot, and even on size. You know, the bigger the area, the, the and the, the lower the cost per unit, right, of of production. So it 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 varies so much that. Uh, and it's even within that range of species, it, how many merchantable species there are as opposed to non-merchantable and, and the, you know, poplar, for example, and we're going to use that, it, it's just hard to sell. Uh, red pine, you know, it's hard, it's hard to sell. Uh, larch, hard to sell. And all those trees, that white birch, it's a good firewood of a split, but nobody needs to want it. They want to want sugar maple and red maple and beech. But, so it's a lot of non-merchantable materials, and it depends on the mix of those as to what the cost would be. So I can't give you an answer. I'm sorry. I can give you a ballpark if that would help any. Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, what I'm just looking here, not the maker? thanks, Chair, not necessarily for the merchantable um, potential of the wood, but just in order to clear up an acre of land which has been damaged by Fiona, yeah. severely damaged by Fiona. Uh, just a ballpark would be helpful. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'll not hold you to yeah, it. I'm leery of even mentioning a number because you know it it varies so much. I you know it it has it has to be a wide range of you know. Uh, Can you tell me <coughs> what the yeah, upper upper it, limit it might be? be a wide a range of from one thousand to five thousand. Uh, that would be the range. It's mm. a it's a wide range. I'm sorry. No, no, that's fine. And okay. Can okay. I ask for clarification? Uh, yeah, that? clarification. This is a really important point, um, and that. Lonson would be, and again, I, I realize it's a wide range that you've just given me, but that would be to clear the land, remove the stumps, and sort of re return it to... Well, again, if you're, if, depending what you're doing with the, the landowner, has a series of values with what they want to do with the land. Now, uh, if they're converting it to, to farmland, for example, then they would remove the stumps, right? Or blueberry land, for example. Yeah. But if they're going to grow another forest, they wouldn't have to remove yeah, the stuff sure. they could plant in the In fact, they wouldn't have to remove even the brush yeah. because we can plant, you know, uh, with either site prep equipment, equipment or just manually, we can plant in the opening. So it depends on what you want to do with the uh, property afterwards. So, yeah. Okay, uh, I'm just just to <laughs> clarify a little bit. I know one of the issues, like when you talked about Fiona and the issues of the, that whole reality, uh, you know, John Arthur Ramsey. I, I had a long uh, talk with him on the on the issue, and and that whole issue of qualifications based on the income you had to derive a certain income out of your uh, your woodlot. Well. 
you know, even myself, I, maybe every 10 years I might uh, start to generate a little bit of income or else, you know, cut off a, a five acre block or 10 acre block or something along that line. So, so I think that's a good point to make that, you know, that this is a unique industry that it doesn't always have income for woodlot owners every year, and, but it, it is over a longer period of time to get average in that. Uh, Brad Trivers' question, and we're going to kind of try to start wrapping up here in about another five minutes, so. Okay. Well, well, thank you, Chair. And, um, so earlier on, um, Watson, what you were saying, I was taking notes here, that uh, the money was all used up from the salvage program and that uh, it had provided help, although the money didn't necessarily go to the woodlot owners. It did allow the cleanup to happen, which, you know, leaves something to be desired. However, you're, you're advocating for more money to be given there. So it sounds like there was a program in place and it did help, but more money is needed. Also, there's the forest enhancement program. And maybe that's tied in with the salvage program you're talking about. That is the it, one, it right? Is. Um, and then just today, we announced the Hurricane Fiona Forestry Recovery Program for people who didn't qualify for the FEP because they didn't have uh, big enough wood lots, right? And that was something I advocated hard for because I had several constituents who, you know, for example, in Cavendish, they had really badly damaged wood lots adjacent to, you know, large uh, tourist operations that they were worried if fire risk was the primary concern. So, I mean, the member across seemed to be putting some words in your mouth a little bit by saying that, you know, the programs didn't help you at all when it seems like they did. But I wanted to find out from you directly, um, other than uh, needing more money for the salvage program, the FEP, um, did it, is, is the structure of the program what you'd like to see? And also, is this new Hurricane Fiona Forestry Recover Program for the smaller woodlots something that's going to help any of your members at all? I don't know if you're all giant woodlot owners or not. Thank you. Uh, yeah, oh, well. Uh, Watson Hapful. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you're right. I'm jumping the gun again. No, you can always <laughs> say your own name if you want to. Uh, I just, uh, it's just for the, the audio. The FEP is a wonderful program, Forest Enhancement Program. It's a wonderful program. And, uh, you know, it's there to try to help woodlot owners uh, through this long 40-year <laughs> stretch between uh, sales, uh, you know, through uh, planting and, and thinning and, and growing trees and, and uh, you know, that type of thing. And so it's a wonderful program for that. I'm not, I don't want to criticize it at all. And uh, the salvage program was part of that as a response uh, to Fiona, uh, that as well. So it... it uh, you know, it, it just, uh, in the way it's done, it's, it's a sort of a structure set up with forest technicians. There's forest, provincial forest technicians throughout the island. Each one has their territory, and they are responsible for the given territories and the, and the woodlot owners in that territory. And that they, when a, when a woodlotter comes to them and say, well, I want to get some work done on my property, they, are, they send out a list of forest consultants, and they set in a list of forest contractors. And that's as much as they are able to do because of a conflict of interest uh, thing going on there. They can't favor any particular contractor. And then uh, the, the landowner then phone, starts phoning different people to try to talk to them, and the, it becomes a series of negotiations between the landowner and the contractor as to what happens on their property and the economic returns or non-returns uh, of that contract and, and the specifications as to, you know, how, how, how much will be done, where, you know, what species, the height of the stumps and, you know, all this stuff and damage to the roadway. And, you know, all this is covered under, under contract and private negotiations. So they, the smaller woodlots, and as I mentioned before, they're not as viable for, for big equipment to get on because there's such a small volume of them. Uh, so there is a limitation there. Unless there was two or three in, beside each other, adjoining, uh, or close by because of the floating costs. Uh, so that, that, there is a limitation on small woodlots. And I, I don't want to, I, I guess, clar I want to clarify too. <clears throat> as well, because of the negotiation process between the contractors and landowners, I don't really know exactly what overall the whole island has taken place in, in negotiations and what percentage would be, you know, salvage fee going to contractors or, or not. I know from my own experience what has happened, uh, and it, it, there is a variation of, of, of that, with 100% going to contractors sometime and less going to, uh, to others, and depending on the uh, mostly the size of the lot and the volume and, and the 
quality materials. Okay, you have clarification, Brad? Yeah, uh, just so a, Brad, a clarification, uh, then we're going to thanks. go to the final words to be to Peter Bevan Baker, to put words in whoever's mouth <laughs> chooses. <laughs> just a quick follow-up. So um, my, my colleague pointed out that you probably have not seen the details of the Hurricane Fiona Forestry Recovery Program. So um, I'm really interested to hear what you think of that program and any improvements you would see to it. So uh, I, I was wondering if I, could, if I could request you to maybe take a look at it and just provide a short email or letter back uh, to the committee if the committee is okay with it, uh, with your opinions on it, because I, I would really like to, to hear if it, if it is beneficial or what need to change. That's all. That's all. Yeah, well, if there's a problem just announced, it's hard to comment on it. So well, I guess we'll, we'll allow, if, if they so choose to want to respond uh, on uh, that particular program, you can you can just pop us off an email or a letter would, from a behalf of your Woodlot Owners Association would be appropriate. Peter Bevan Baker. Thank you. Uh, so many questions left, but I, I appreciate yeah. it. And we do have, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing from the next presenters as well. So I'll be very, very quick. I just want to clarify that in order for wood to be stamped here, it does not have to be kiln dried or planed. Is that correct? That's yes. correct. Right. Uh, there is, a, uh, if you're using it uh, under the limitations of, let's say, 212, I think, uh, square feet or whatever, for a small building for non farmers, non fishermen. Uh, then it, it could be green, what we would call green lumber. Right. And, and so, and there isn't even green stamped lumber from some of the, the people that are uh, able to, it took a course and it, uh, the small mills, I think it's 12 of them now are able to, right. to provide stamp lumber on their site. They can't, they can't travel, the stamp can't travel around. Right. It's got to be on their particular site, but yeah, does that answer? Yes, it does. Um, and just up, up, again, very quickly, Chair. Uh, the, the legislative restriction then seems to be simply the size of the building that would be allowed to be used. There's no other reason why we can't do this. But I understand there's a capital expense in having a portable sawmill available to do that. Um, would, you, would you be in favor of government? Because it's not that expensive buying half a dozen of these and making them available to woodlot owners so that you personally don't have to come up with that expense. Well, that, that's, very, that's, that's a very interesting question uh, because uh, I'd have to say yes, I'm in favor personally, but I'm telling you the, the small bandsaw mills out there that are traveling around or that have their own mills would not be in favor of that sure. because of the, a, let's say, unfair competition from government. And uh, you'd hear screams all over the place sure. if, you, uh, if, if government were to do that. Now, mind you, I'd be quite happy with it. <laughs> we used to have, if you remember way back when, uh, we had 30 homeowners that had wood chip uh, gasifiers. And you may, may or may not remember this. And uh, they had wood chippers. The government had wood chippers. And I was responsible for that, uh, for the maintenance and the rentals uh, of them. And uh, you know, they, there weren't a lot of wood chippers around at that time for using, for making fuel. So, there was, uh, you know, there was still a hue and cry about their private people who wanted, didn't want government involved in the private sector. Okay, thanks. Well, I'm going to try to wrap things up here. So I want to thank the Woodlot Donors Association for their presentation. And obviously there are more questions that we probably could have, and this, this discussion could probably go on a lot longer. I, I would argue that if anybody wants to email them or they want to respond back on anything in future, we still have an open line of communication, so you're welcome to do that. So I'm going to uh, thank you for your presentation, uh, thank you for the information you provided, and we're going to have a, maybe a two or three minute recess so we can go to our next item on the agenda, which is the PEI Watershed Alliance. So short recess. Thank you, everybody.
reconvene our uh, committee meeting on natural resources, environmental sustainability, and, and uh, I, actually I erred in not introducing all the people that are at their table here. So we have Peter Bevan Baker, uh, Bradley Trivers, and Hilton McLennan, and then we have an observing member, Susie Dillon. So I, I should have done that earlier, I guess. Anyway, so now we have our next item on the agenda, which is the PEI Watershed Alliance, and we have Heather Glaskinos, uh, Charlotte Large, and Juliana Fernandez Granzotti. Boy, I kind of, those are tougher names. I should have, I should have read that before, uh, looked at that before I started. Uh, so, uh, anyway, so I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourself for the each mic. So that's our biggest issue with the audio. And I, and I, in the last presentation, I, I kept intervening saying the name, and that's mostly for the audio. But if you want to say your own name <laughs> to help me out a bit on that, then, then our audio people know which person is speaking at that particular time. So either way, either I have to say it or you do to try to help uh, help our audio uh, staff. So I'll turn it over uh, to uh, Heather and you can take it from there. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having us. We're really thrilled to be presenting today. I recognize a lot of you from community meetings, so it's really nice to see you. Um, I just prepared a brief um, presentation for you when I approached on this, um, I made it clear that we're not the experts in any of these fields. We're expected to know um, a fairly good amount of knowledge in all of these fields that we work in. So I thought I'd give you a brief overview of what the Watershed Alliance does and what our groups do. Let's see here. Don't know if I have a... Charlotte, you wanna... My apologies, I cannot help you. Is there some? Doesn't seem to be moving. Not a touch screen. <laughs> ah, there we go. Oh. I think it was just on a lag. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, who we are? We're a nonprofit. We established in 2010. Uh, we have 25 uh, watershed groups that we support uh, across the island. Uh, we cover 90 plus percent. That number kind of varies. It goes from 93, 95, 97 at one point. Um, that we work uh, on the island and we do those the improvements uh, to protect the environment and the quality of the PEI watershed, of our watersheds, and also we advocate, advocate for uh, better environmental policies. And who we work with. These are by no way, shape, or form all of our stakeholders, but probably our most important. Uh, we work with farmers, forestry, fishing, municipalities, indigenous group. We're very, we work very closely with the province. Um, I'm probably there or there at our office every week. Um, and the Department of Transportation is also a big partner. We do work with, within a lot of environmental uh, NGOs as well. And we'll also show up on your land if you ask us to and make recommendations. Um, so I'm gonna talk about our work and how we approach our work and uh, so that you have a kind of a, a holistic understanding of how, watershed lo how watersheds look at the land and how they prioritize. So basically, we look at the whole watershed. We don't just look at one issue or one solution. We learn how our water and our sediment move to make the most informed decisions. And we must understand how our ecosystem functions in concert with all the pressures. Those pressures are obviously land use, but they also include things like climate change, um, and superstorms, Fiona, who knows what the next one's gonna be named. So we, we're also looking at how to mitigate things. So if we see a problem from one storm, we try and think of what we can do to mitigate for the next storm. And then we consider how the work affects all the branches, whatever we're doing on that land and in water. And it's in a circle because we call it sort of biovigilance. So we're constantly working, learning, evaluating. So whatever we say for one area might be true before Fiona, might not be true after Fiona. We might have to, to update. So when, uh, when I explain how we do things, I hope you understand this when we look at recommendations um, that we're looking at not just coastal protections, which is I, what I know that you asked me to come and present on today. So there is um, a dimension here that of what the Alliance and the watershed groups do for coastal protections. Um, there's a lot of work that we do. I know some of you are very aware of some of the work that we do, um, but I just focus today on what we do for coastal erosion and coastal protections. So our, probably our most famous at this point uh, project that we do are our living shorelines. Um, this site is a demonstration site in front of a, a Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Uh, we took out the rock gabion and we put in natural shoring, natural shrubs. Um, and this is uh, 
one of three demonstration sites that we did. We did another two in Stratford. Um, so a lot of our groups are doing this and helping landowners on private land. Charlotte actually goes out frequently and uh, advises land, private landowners on what they can do uh, to enhance their shorelines. Um, so this is one of the big pro uh, projects that we're involved in. Um, there, living shorelines are not a silver bullet, though. They're not going to fix everything. Um, they're not feasible on those really high cliffs. Um, and they're very site specific. You really have to know how your sediment moves and your water moves to make these recommendations. So um, you can't just say, well, I planted shrubs and now I have a living shoreline. There's, there's, a, there, there's a lot involved into it. And we find that these things work better with community partnerships. Um, we try to involve as many people as we can when we do uh, embark on these projects. So that's one of the big things that we do for coastal erosion and coastal protection. Oops. <laughs> I don't seem to have a, a, a mouse. Oh. Let's kind of try that. OK. <laughs> Some other things that we do is that we work on educational campaigns explaining the benefits of native <coughs> plants for soil retention and the benefits for our wildlife. You know, some people are like, well, but I've got tons of Japanese knotweed on my shore. At least there's something. Mm -hmm. um, but, which is an invasive species, sorry, if you don't yeah. know what Japanese yeah. knotweed is. Don't want that. <laughs> but um, th they have really, really shallow roots and rhizomic roots that, um, that don't actually retain the soil. So this is one of the reasons why we try to educate people on why they need these native plants, because, you know, we, we need that, that good root system in there. Uh, we encourage landowners not to mow to the edge of their property. I was at a site visit last month uh, for our two billion trees project that we administer, and uh, they had lost five meters on the North Shore. I think it was in your area, Brad. And um, very nice couple. They, we had us out to see what we could do for their area, and they were still mowing all the way to the end. And she, so I just said, you know, you might want to consider, co you know, contacting your local watershed group, and you know, maybe, maybe stop mowing that far. And she said, oh, we'd never heard of this. So, you know, as much as we think our voice is out there and what we're doing and educating, there's always more work to be done. And these are very nice landowners that were very concerned and wanted to increase the biodiversity on their property. So they weren't anti any of this, she just said they hadn't heard of it. So we, we do our best to educate. And then uh, you may have heard some about some coarse woody debris. We also encourage landowners, especially <coughs> in the Lake of Fiona. Uh, on the coast, we encourage our landowners to not to clear everything. Um, we find that those things, um, one, if you pile them up, you can move them. Obviously, we're not saying don't touch a tree. <laughs> but if you um, place them on the shore on the coast, um, it allows the new growth behind it to establish itself prior to the wind um, and those, those you know, really abrasive North Shore winds and even the South Shore winds that can come on the coast that really can take it down. So of course woody debris is important just to kind of reestablish those, those um, plantings uh, there. So before I get into solutions, I just want to share a quick story. Um, yesterday I told somebody I was presenting on our work um, for you today and he said, well don't get your hopes up. They've only invited you there to dot their I's and cross their T's. Ooh. <laughs> I am known, I have been called painfully optimistic, so I just want you all to know that I hope that's not true, and I'm going to believe that it's not, um, because I want everybody to understand that the watershed groups, we don't ask the foresters to stop cutting down trees, we don't ask the farmers to stop farming, and we certainly don't ask the fishers to stop fishing. What we do is we work with them in concert to find best management practices and to improve the environment. We understand that we all have to live on this tiny island, right? Uh, and with that said, I think it's time we looked at developers and hold them accountable for some best management practices. So a lot of these solutions, you might think, what do they have to do with coastal erosion? Well, I'm gonna hopefully give you a holistic picture of why. So the first thing that I, um, we're going to suggest is a funding partnership for islanders to establish living shorelines. Now, I said they're not the silver bullet, they're not, but they are better solutions. Mm -hmm. Mother Nature needs to move. <laughs> she needs that space. And you can see that great. It's not harsh. It looks like a natural, a natural landscape. And these are the things that are going to absorb that wave, those hard waves crashing in, and um, slow wave attenuation um, throughout the, you know, the back end of the, the property. So those are things that we believe. And we believe in the partnerships, because these things need care. They need a 
time to, to establish. So we need people to take care of it. It's living. We can't just build it and be done with it. So these things, uh, we are constantly going back and revising. So that's one recommendation we have for you. Um, obviously, better coastal setback protections. I had a, a chance to uh, look over the presentation that Mike Davies gave the engineer, and everything in there we agree with. There wasn't anything in there that was a surprise to us. I hope you do look at those recommendations, um, that they were great. Um, but I, then, so we wanted to um, illustrate this one for better, better coastal setback protections. This summer, we had a joint partnership with the Aquaculture Alliance to, um, for a fund for uh, the DFO for uh, cleaning up ghost gear. So our watershed groups um, have covered the entire island, which was a really great project, a really good partnership. We love partnerships. Um, but I wanted to show you this one. This is a house. This is a baby bread. I think it's in Brackley, actually. This is... Um, started in one spot, um, and Fiona, it floated over one person's property onto a third <laughs> riparian zone. And this is where it sits. And it floated so nicely that it lo almost looks like it was built there. <laughs> <laughs> so the windows aren't even broken. Um, and we got word, the DFO said, no, that this is, does not count under the mandate for cleaning up the ghost gear. And this now sits there, and it's nobody's responsibility as of right now. Nope. I know. <laughs> so we, uh, yes, they do. And I, from what I understand, they advertise it on Facebook that they had a free house if you wanted to come get it. This <laughs> is a whole separate issue. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that is smack dab in the riparian zone, and um, it's sitting there. And we were fortunate enough that we were able to get the propane tanks out of there. But you know, I'm sure there's you know, fiberglass, there's going to be glass. I mean, that's going to be on somebody's beach soon. So yeah. these are these are the reasons why we need those setbacks. And, you know, we don't have a lot of advice for people who have homes on the coast. We really don't. You know, it's, they, there's not a, there's not a lot of options. You know, the only thing we can do is look forward um, and how we're going to do it better. Um, so this one, this is where I want you to keep in mind that, that uh, how we look at the whole holistic picture. <clears throat> we need to establish mandatory soil erosion control plans for all clear cutting and development. And what does that mean? Well, we're not going to tell you what you can do. You're not going to tell anybody what they can do with their woodlot because that's not your right. You don't have that, right? But what you can do before anyone does clear cutting or development, you can actually just make them have a soil erosion control plan. And what is that? It's just to show what best management practices will be used and where, as well as the total disturbance area. The plan must include measures to prevent erosion, contain sediment, and control drainage. Now, this is actually uh, a farmer, um, Charles Visser, who's um, working with the watershed group here. And it did, but it, it illustrates how much just soil is just loosely sitting on, on these lands that just go right into our water. Now, why is that important? Because half of our watershed groups spend half, or all of our watershed groups spend up to 50% of their of their summer dealing with legacy sediment. This is something that is so easy. You just have to say, hey, put a, let us know how you're going to control sediment before you start clear cutting your trees. Now, this is the holistic picture I'm asking you to all to look at because if you help us in dealing with the legacy <coughs> control sediment issues that we watershed groups are doing, we have more time to educate, to go out, talk to people about coastal erosions, and do different work. Because right now we are spending this time looking for funding to, you know, dredge um, ponds because they're they've eutrophied and they're, you know, they're they, the fish can't get up them anymore. So this is something that we really believe in that will help. Green development standards. Now, lots of communities use these. Um, and it's very simple. It seems like a line item you could write in new de developments. Require all new developments to have 30% mandatory green space. Now, 30% is my ideal. But, you know, that, that's, that can always change. Um, but habitat corridors are important because you want to look at everything as biodiverse, right? You, don't, you can't just look at one issue. You have to consider the whole picture. Now, if we don't have animals, why, you know, we don't have that healthy ecosystem. So even in small areas, even in Charlottetown, I live downtown, and all the new developments, they're just parking lots. There's not even a single room for one shrub on there. Now, imagine if we take all this great you know, rural area that we're going to develop, and, and we don't require green 
any greening of these spaces. That's, I mean, that's just going to make, also just makes a community better. I mean, you know, if you go to New York, Central Park is, you know, it's the crown, you know, they, it's a green space. Now, if they hadn't had, had that 100 years ago, I guarantee you that would not be the case. So these are the things that we're asking that, you know, look forward, look at how you want things to develop, because there's not much we can do for people on the coast now, and that's just how it is. And then finally, forest banking. I know I've talked to at least one of you in this room about forest banking, but I have some paperwork on it. It works like wetland banking. And this is where it gets a little complicated, um, where you can look at carbon credits. So um, we, we want to encourage uh, woodlot owners to keep their woodlots. So if, but we also want development, but we want sustainable development. So if they have an area where they want to take down a woodlot, they can pay somebody to keep their woodlot. So it works like wetland banking. And I have some um, background information on it if you want some information. I don't have um, a lot of uh, background. Um, there's a county in Maryland that's doing it, that's uh, done it very successfully. And if you go down there, it's actually a gorgeous place to be because they were facing the exact same pressures of development um, that PEI is facing, but there's happened in the 90s. And. Uh, yeah, that's that's us. <laughs> I think that's my whole presentation. So. Oh, good. So, anyway, I guess I, you made a statement there, just that you were considered maybe a token presenter. <laughs> I, I would assure you that that's not the case. I, uh, I didn't think so. I, I, I would argue that uh, this is a. a committee of all different parties, and you have a, a variety of viewpoints, and I think it's incumbent upon us to hear all the different points of view. So what people and committee members take out of each one. I mean, some will agree and some won't, but that's, yeah. it, we st it's still that's about a, an importance of getting a variety of viewpoints. So, uh, so we appreciate your presentation based on that. Uh, open for questions. Uh, Peter, to start with, and then Brad, second. Thank you, Chair, and I appreciate the comments you just made. And absolutely, your voice is important, and the work that you do is unbelievably important across our island when I think about buying for public bucks. Um, I can think of no other organization that we get more value for the relatively small amount of money that goes to the Watershed Association um, and your various tributaries across the province, um, and thank you for the work that you do. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about your living shorelines, and you mentioned it's not a silver bullet and it's site-specific. So first question would be, are there places where um, living shorelines or any other sort of protection is just not advisable. Yeah, I will get him uh, well, that up to Charlotte. <laughs> so, who wants to? Yeah, Charlotte Large. There you go. Uh, Charlotte Large. Um, so, uh, I've gone out quite a bit. Once we put in those demonstration sites a few years ago, uh, I've sort of been the one primarily looking into this. And again, I don't have the in-depth technical knowledge that, say, that um, presentation that you'd looked at previously talked a lot about movement of sediment and wave attenuation and those very technical um, details. So I don't have that background. Mine's very much coming from the space of sort of walking the land, seeing what's feasible, more of that generalist perspective. And what I found talking to those experts and meeting with landowners and looking at their land is one of the issues we've come up with is a lot of living shoreline uh, interventions, they can be either very simple, as simple as just a certain planned planting, or they can be very complex in that there's a lot of design involved, a lot of sort of complex uh, hybridized like contract work. So they can be in a, a spectrum of complexity. And one of the issues I think that we've seen from our demonstration sites with that in mind is that a lot of our sort of high sheer cliff faces. So you know the images you see in like tourism uh, photos and such where it's, it's a sheer cliff, beautiful view, and you see all that red sand. Um, those uh, with greater storm surge tend to erode quite quickly. Um, and when you think about, well, could we put a living shoreline intervention on there? For a high cliff like that, there really, to my mind, isn't a sort of feasible method to do that because the face is so sheer and to attempt to do it would be so prohibitively expensive for what may end up not working if a huge storm came through before it had established in the first place. In that case, I'd recommend you know, setting a, a setback and just encouraging more planting to root in as much as possible. But when people think uh, like living shorelines, they think of you know, 
anchoring in logs and sort of putting it out that way, but for a cliff face that's just not possible, mm -hmm. which is a lot of what we have here, especially say on the North Shore. So that makes it a bit more complicated. In that case, I usually recommend like not mowing or, or doing some uh, intensive planting as much as possible, but that is definitely not a silver bullet and it's certainly, while it may anchor in slow erosion, it certainly won't stop it um, because those areas erode quite quickly. Um, so that's, that's definitely an area where I would look at it and it's kind of something where, where you go, there are some things we can do, but certainly they're not gonna be perhaps as helpful as a private landowner might hope. Um, and really their only solution there is retreat in a lot of cases. Juliana? Hi, thank you for your question, Peter. Um, Levy Shore Alliance, as Heather mentioned, it is a site-specific. Uh, when you deal with PI that have high cliffs facing different locations and you have wave uh, strength, you can also use like a hybrid system. Um, I'm not in favor of the armoring. I think that's what we have been doing for so long. You just change the problem to your neighbor. However, hybrid systems could be something that could be feasible now until living shorelines you can actually implement to do it the way they should be. Um, as Charlotte mentioned, you can set back, you can make your cliff 45 degrees, but if you have a property that is no bigger than this, how are you gonna do all those components to have a living shoreline? So, hybrid system could be something that I've been dealing with, or you talk with experts that now that have more companies that offer this kind of expertise and help with that. Uh, Heather? Heather? Yeah. Um, just to more specifically to your question, um, I wouldn't say that there's anything we wouldn't recommend it for, but we are exploring partnerships with the Climate Lab and other groups and um, the like municipalities, Mount Stewart, that we're looking at. Um, how does that look? And the truth is we don't know right now and we're, we're all getting engineers and looking at proposals to say how does a hybrid system with traditional engineering pair with that. So, but I don't have an answer for that but for you at this moment. Okay. Do you have a clarification question? Um, Peter? Yeah, uh, regarding you, I think the second recommendation you had was for better setback protections. And I'm just going to because better is a is a, one of those plastic words. Uh, what do you actually mean by that? Uh, so as far as that, this one, I was mirroring what actually what was in Mike Davies' proposal. Um, but you can, you know, there there are certain um, developments that you can do um, just farther back, or require um, setback protections that would require uh, vegetation on the buffer. Mm -hmm. Um, I know there's some communities I've heard, I'm not sure which ones, where people have told me when they, they have these sort of um, summer communities where they have mandates where they have to mow because of the view. And so these are things that, that I think would be a, a setback protection. Okay, Brad, Brad thank Trivers. Well, thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, like, like Peter, I've been a long time supporter of the Watershed Alliance and the Watershed groups, and, you know. I like to think played a small role anyways in increasing the, the government money that goes to your organization over the years and you do great work if there's any criticism it's us politicians take too much credit for the great work that you guys do <laughs> and your passionate volunteers so so thanks again. Um, so my question is about the living shorelines as well. I know that they've been around for a long time. I remember back in 2016 uh, meeting with a group called Helping, a company, Helping Nature Heal yep. from mm -hmm. over in Nova Scotia, yeah. and they mm -hmm. had done a big project in Cap Habibut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and they had, I think they had some limited success there. Yeah. And I was wondering uh, if you can comment on how the Living Shoreline Solutions might have changed, say, from seven years ago to now. Are we talking about the same thing? Because there's a, I think there's a bit of a myth out there that they don't work, and I'm hearing that they, they should. So, and, and perhaps we're think, not talking you know, apples and apples, we might be comparing. Yeah, I, I, sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah we, we aren't talking apples and apples. I mean, it's funny, we, we presented um, out in Victoria at the Coastal Zone uh, Canada um, this past June, and, and the Climate Lab was there, and they, they were monitoring uh, eight hard armored sites, um, all of which failed during Fiona, just FYI. And we had three, and none of our, um, our uh, living shoreline sites failed. Um, actually, Juliana and I worked for the South Shore, and we're very familiar right. with the Camp Abiquet yeah. and, and with uh, Helping Nature uh, Heal. And um, it was also a master's student's project. Um, that 
in my opinion, and I think Juliana will back me up, it, it, the cliff face there was just, we have spent so much time there planting and, and doing so much work, but I think it's just natural erosion. I mean, it faces, it's right there, and it's just a cliff. I and mean, we, we've taken out, we've moved the fence back there at probably 10 meters. Uh, and uh, it, it, my last recommendation before I left the South Shore was just leave it alone. There's not much we can do for it. You know, it's, it isn't protecting a hospital or, you know, some big infrastructure. It's sadly, you know, a beautiful campsite for children with a learning center on it. Um, but so, you know, it's just do we want, you have to look at where you want to focus your energy. And it just, we didn't feel with that cliff face that it was, um, uh, it was a good use of our time. Juliana? Um, so, fortunately, I do work for the South Shore, but when I started, Camp Abigrade was already completed. Uh, so I was not part of the project. So uh, it, I did hear people saying that was a failure, unfortunately, but it, it was a failure because at the moment that was built, it was not completely right. So I don't know what happened between there. Uh, it was supposed to be a living shorelines, but they didn't put it the living part. Uh, I think at the time we had an issue with a tangled whale, so the twine that they use, they could not use anymore because of some of the protection. So I do understand that people see it as a failure, but it was not a failure because it was just not done correctly, in my opinion. Um, besides having a face cliff and everything else, uh, it could have been used different approach where could it could potentially, but Cape Abbey always suffer a lot of damage after the winter. So we did use all the protections on the top of the cliff and a little under just to kind of minimize the effect. So as you mentioned, it's just you play as after season just to see how it goes. Uh, but yeah, it's even though they said it's a failure, I just think it was not done as should be. And we didn't have that mentality we had now. It's a match for seven years. So what we have learned from seven years. So you need to have those uh, how do you say? You need to have those demonstration sites so you know how you can do better. You know how things work in the different components, what's their stressors, and how this methodology works in A, B, and C sites, right? So that's me. Charlotte? Yes, um, I just wanted to kind of clarify a few things too. Is when we're, we're using this term living shorelines, which is quite a broad term, it's not necessarily as specific as perhaps it could be, and that's something I've talked about with our more technical partners of, are we using that term correctly? But for our purposes, it, it's fine. Um, and it is something that, you know, especially in the West Coast, um, there's quite a bit of work on this concept of like nature-based solutions and living shorelines, and the demonstration sites that we had put in two years ago um, were following uh, the Green Shores program that exists in British Columbia um, that uses nature-based solutions and living shorelines and actually like certifies them. It's a very, uh, a very detailed prescribed program that works with a lot of technical partners in BC for private landowners or for development. So we were sort of taking their approaches, seeing if they're applicable here and seeing sort of our, how these approaches work on PEI because obviously our ecosystem, our soils are very different than anywhere else. So a lot of what we're talking about here is very much new and an experiment in the sense of does this work here and seeing things like Camp Abbey or our demonstration sites and how they're reacting to the circumstances, how they react to Hurricane Fiona is very much us taking stock of here are the approaches that work elsewhere. Do they work here? How do they function in our system? How can we improve them so that we can have that knowledge of what is possible here versus elsewhere because we are in a very unique position as an island with such a high population density and so many pressures and our soil is so incredibly different even from just Nova Scotia. Um, so when we're talking about like looking at these different sites like Camp Abbey or otherwise um, and saying like well this site failed that may or may, maybe it doesn't reduce the erosion as much as we had hoped mm -hmm. or whatever case but from those sites I think We've positioned them as sort of learning experiences, and from that, we're getting good <coughs> knowledge of what is going to be possible in the future and what is worth investing in uh, as we move forward to keep nature-based solutions while still 
uh, adapting and, and uh, investing wisely, essentially. Brad Travers, a clarity question? Yeah. So, um, I mean, it, it sounds to me, to paraphrase that, you know, Living Shorelines, you're learning, you're changing with, with new knowledge, you're improving the Living Shoreline solutions. Some places just are simply not suitable for them. Mm -hmm. um, now, you mentioned that earlier about working with uh, homeowners associations. Uh, for example, uh, up on the North Shore, I've got the Luke Street uh, Homeowners Association. So they actually just replaced all their hard armoring um, mm -hmm. all along the shoreline. And now the good news is they got um, pretty much every property owner to buy in. And so the at the ends of the armoring, it, it kind of goes into the base, so it's not as bad. I guess my question uh, for you is, uh, because they all want to do things <coughs> the best they can, uh, is there uh, an opportunity to take their hard, ar hard armoring and hybrid it with some sort of living shoreline solution possibly? And should, uh, is it um, possible for them to, to contact the local watershed group, maybe to work together in a partnership with them to explore how that might happen? Is that something you would encourage? I will go ahead and mm -hmm. yeah. no. <laughs> Charlotte? So something that we have done in the past with Helping Nature Heal, actually, something that we experimented with was um, taking existing hard arming, so particularly large like granite boulders, things that are not easily removed, um, and removing them might do more damage than good at the end of the day. Um, what I usually advocate for homeowners always is planting in some capacity. So in that case, I recommend like uh, adding soils between those boulders, planting between them, and trying to encourage growth between what's already mm -hmm. there. It's relatively simple. It's something homeowners can usually do pretty easily. It's accessible. Um, but um, usually when it comes to, uh, when I talk to private landowners who have these concerns, I'll go in. And usually I do recommend like reaching out to their watershed group, getting connected more than anything. Um, and then also reaching out to like the watershed alliance if they're, maybe they don't know their watershed group that well. And just okay. trying to connect people as much as possible. At the end of the day, um, I usually end up uh, sort of cautioning them in the way that there really isn't necessarily a lot of opportunities to get like monetary support for living shorelines right now. Um, we don't have the same programs that exist sort of on the western coast where you know landowners can apply for uh, support for these things. We're hoping that eventually that would become the case, especially since there's so much more interest now post Fiona, um, and a lot of landowners are you know looking at their coastlines and wanting to do something different. Um, so usually I, I recommend getting in contact with watershed groups and if opportunities come up, that's the best way for them to sort of be in the know more or less um, as we go forward, so. Uh, uh, Heather? Yeah, uh, just to not counter what Charlotte is saying, but I would not recommend um, any hard armoring in conjunction with a living shoreline. We can try and work with existing ones, mm -hmm. but I've seen them all be hollowed out. I was. Um, Hilton, I don't know if you've been to uh, uh, Minimagash, the beach up there. Um, yeah, we, we've got some we've got some hard armoring um, that it, it just doesn't go away, and um, because of past bad um, decision making, probably with good intentions, I'm not certainly, but um, I, I definitely would not recommend putting any hard armoring in. Um, in the case where your whole community did it. I, 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 it's very expensive too, and it doesn't. And like I said, it fails more often now mm -hmm. than it used to. So I would never recommend somebody um, put that kind of money into that because it is so expensive. And up in Seaview, we've seen just those beautiful boulders just go right into the ocean. Just there, and they were very expensive. So, uh, Juliana. Um, yes, and the other thing too with the hard armoring is you lose the geomorphological of the ocean and the sand, so you probably will lose beach. It's just, it's hard armoring was always seen as a quick, expensive, but um, short-term protection. Now after Fiona, you see a will skyrim right behind. So my question is for the landowners, are you okay with losing land, but it was not better for you to set back? Or if when you construct <coughs> like your septic tank and everything, you're already planted for a hundred years of storm. Like, it's just a big picture conversation that I understand you have houses that lost erosion for the past a hundred years. I, I work with a property, she's like, my grandfather said when the cliff gets here, I should be worried. And the cliff got there. And I was just like, let's work. So we helped them plant it. 
she hire helping nature heal. So that's what the watersheds can kind of do, but depends on their capacity too. My capacity is educational. If we help with a little bit planting here, maybe more people would be willing to do the same. So yes, tell your homeowners association to talk to the watershed groups, maybe find the best solution to implement more biodiversity and more nature-based solution to that location. That would be our advice. I'm going to add in just to, I don't know how familiar you are with West Point and the, <laughs> the whole issue. So that, and that was uh, done as a recommendation of Mike Davies and Coldwater Consulting. Yeah. Now, we're in a very short window of time, but Armour Stone was used in that particular location. And uh, at the moment, it seems to be working quite well. The beach has actually significantly returned and uh, doesn't seem to be impacting anybody else at this point. I mean, what, like I say, you have to have a longer mm -hmm. uh, yeah. view. But now that was an engineered plan and thought out, and it was also dealt with a, the situation of trying to protect a very iconic structure, the West Point Lighthouse, yeah. right? So options of moving and setbacks and all those things didn't seem to be very viable either there. So I just wanted to mention that. Now, maybe uh, I'll throw that question out to you. Do you have any comments on what's happened in West Point and saying that 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 may be all for naught, <laughs> or well, it, it may work fine. <laughs> Heather speaking. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, you've seen the photos where you have those, the, the hard armoring, and you see the scour behind it. So, um, it you know, nature is dynamic, and she moves, and what may be right today might not right, be right tomorrow. So um, I'm not, obviously, you know, these lighthouses are historic, and they have, you know, a lot of emotional meaning for islanders. So... You know, I'm not going to come out and say don't try and do everything you can to protect your, your lighthouse. You know, we're more concerned about the bigger picture and the longevity of things. So, um, you know, yes, there are West Point and nobody here is going to come out against it. But, uh, um, you know, I'm sure at the beach in Minamagash, if I could take you there, it's covered in, in horrible, dangerous rebar, old construction riprap um, that was uncovered under Fiona. And uh, it's it's just you know because we're dealing with these legacy projects of hard armoring that just didn't work and now you know they had taken the spoils from a channel just for background um, they had um, taken riprap from construction material and put it along and then when they were dredging the channel they covered it thinking not quite maybe understanding that dunes and sands are dynamic and need to move and. And uh, it lasted, I think, 10, 15 years, maybe. And then Fiona came and took all the sand and put all the riprap. And there are literal rusty spikes on that beach right now. Um, so, you know, we're working together, trying to help, you know, the, the watershed coordinator up there who's ready to go and start sawing off this rebar on his beach because, you know, people, people use it. So, you know, there's a lot of consideration that people don't necessarily think of. You don't know, you know, I, I hope for your community's sake, Brad, that that hard armoring project works, but then you don't know what kind of, where those rocks might go 20 years from now. You don't know those things. Um, what we do know is that a nature-based solution is probably not gonna cause uh, long-lasting devastation. Uh, Hilton McClellan. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I've seen it. <clears throat> I had farmland home or shoreline home, I think, uh, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, there was an acre of woods there. Yeah. There's hardly a tree <laughs> left there now. Um, I guess I have a question um, on the watershed group. So do you follow this? Is there a specific number of people or, to work on this, or is it just, you know what I mean? Yeah. You're doing this and this and this and this. I just wonder, is there a specific group or people that... Um, that's all they concentrate on. Um, Heather, thank you. <laughs> no, our our watershed groups are generalists, and we only have like most islanders okay. three to four months to get our work done, and um, we rely heavily on students. Um, so we're talking yeah. about fifteen to twenty year olds that are, are primarily doing this work, and um, some groups, um, some up west, only have a coordinator on seven months out of the year. Um, some ha are lucky enough to have one. Up east, they're a little bit more organized, and they have you know three people working on these things. So it really depends. Uh, each group has a different capacity, and we're we, we try to bring them up and increase everyone's capacity. That's the alliance's job. Um, but there's not, um, to my knowledge, a dedicated coastal protection person in any of our groups. Okay. Um, Follow up question. Hold yeah, for sure. Because um, I'm just thinking here, maybe we should have the funding in place to have that. 
Yes. You know, uh, just a group dedicated on working on shoreline protections instead of working at, you know, rivers and streams. You still need that, but just a dedicated group. Uh, and that's, that's, sorry, I didn't yeah, cut you off. I'm so sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm not used to Just say your name at the start. We're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of why I brought up that holistic picture about legacy sediment and the things that, you know, our, our groups have these watershed plans. Um, and a lot of the watershed groups started because of anglers. You know, let's, you know, so a lot of those mandates are for, you know, the fishing community and the angling community. But yeah, I mean, that's why we need some of these things to shift off of us from this direction. Mm -hmm that we've been dealing with for 30 plus years that maybe we could have some more movement on it so that we can shift just like nature does to a new problem. Yeah, I was thinking that, like I say, a group that's dedicated right mm -hmm. for this for Islanders. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Brad Trivers. Thanks, Chair. So my question is about uh, soil erosion control, mm -hmm. which is uh, an extremely important topic and I'm glad you raised it. It's uh, It's been a problem for many, many years and you know, the, for example, you look at the Clyde River that goes through New Glasgow. Apparently once upon a time, you know, 100 or 200 years ago, they used to build ships in New Glasgow. And these were the big, giant, like, uh, ships. And they could just, they could float them, sail them out to the coast. And now, I mean, with the, the, the you can barely get through it. That's <laughs> Peter here, right? So um, there's obviously been a ton of sedimentation that's come in. Yeah. Now, there, I... You, you kind of allude to the fact there aren't any so, soil erosion um, controls in place, but it seems seems to me, I know every building project I see, they're, they're attempting to do it. Um, you know, most recently I was out at a development on Rompire Point Road, and they were asked by the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure to put in temporary soil erosion controls for this winter. They were costing upwards of $80,000, and these are temporary. They're going to fill them back in so they can use the lots. Um, I guess... I, I think more, in my opinion, the issue is, is probably more with whether our soil con, uh, erosion controls are adequate and whether we're planning them far enough advance and this sort of thing. And there was another one, St. Patrick's Thrill Hill, mm -hmm. where they ripped out a whole bunch of sill traps that were already there and put, replaced them with less. So have you, are you aware of what the soil erosion control measures are within government? And I believe it would be in Department of Transportation. And have you ever opened a dialogue with them uh, giving feedback on what you think the soil erosion control should be. Heather? Uh, um, thank you. Uh, yes, we have actually a really good relationship with some of the people at uh, the Department of Transportation. Uh, there, are con there are soil control measures in place for sure. Uh, part of that is our 15 meter buffer zone, um, you know, not being able to work in the riparian zone, which came up at the last meeting. Um, um, there are those, and we are aware of them. What we're asking for um, are, um, is that people submit a, a soil erosion plan before they do any of these projects, which they're not required to do now. And we um, have, um, I'm not sure, most of you are probably aware, especially our rural communities, um, we don't have a lot of policing on this island for any of these things. So all we can do is put these in place, um, you know, um, the, the, they're getting better, but if we don't require them to do it, um, unless they're, they're pretty much doing these things because they don't want the bad PR, you know, that's, that's, kind, of, that's kind of the thing. So we need, we need to have, you know, they should submit a soil erosion control plan of how they're going to do before they do it um, is what we're advocating for. But we are aware, and we do work closely with the Department of Transportation. Okay. Peter Bevan Baker. A while now is of mm -hmm. the um, area around the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Just yesterday, Susie chaired a meeting here uh, regarding the mental health campus, <laughs> which is in construction currently, yep. with the largest portions of it still to come. Uh, over $100 million will be invested in that. Just and they, we heard yesterday that they've actually lost some of the land that they figured they could use for the campus because of. Um, erosion concerns. You have, as one of the areas where you have a demonstration living shoreline uh, project. Do you know whether government has plans to maintain what you have there or what, they're, what they see as adequate protection for that sort of investment of public dollars? Heather? 
Yes. Um, yes, we've been working with the city of Charlottetown because uh, they own uh, that property. And so they have submitted. Uh, it's interesting to note uh, this property um, survived Fiona, but did not survive the freeze winter. thaw <laughs> of the winter. <laughs> yes. So what ended up happening here is a, a large, now the top of it looks great, but the bottom where those large logs are, it got scoured out. So it actually, it's scoured out like under a meter under there. Um, we did do sediment, um, we, we did have sediment studies and water movement studies on this. What we're thinking is that maybe Fiona possibly changed um, something under the, 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 the mm -hmm. seabed, um, things of that nature. So we are invested in making this site better. The Alliance is kind of, we're, we're done with that project. We don't have any more money. So we've been working with, and Charlotte especially has been working with the city of Charlottetown to help get a grant to continue and, and um, possibly putting some offshore reefs to see if that also helps with wave attenuation. So, um, yeah. Clarity question? Peter? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, the perception, right or wrong, um, is that the um, sort of platinum level, if I can put it that way, shoreline protection is hard armoring, and you know, we've seen places. I, I, I know that you you have all said in your own way that you have concerns about that. Um, do you have any sense as to whether the province is planning to do hard armoring in this particular instance, given what's going on? Just in land? I have no idea. Oh, sorry, Heather. Heather. <laughs> and Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte. Um, from the discussions that I've had, and again, this has mostly been with the city of Charlottetown and uh, Ellens Creek Watershed Group, yeah. um, with regards to this site specifically, for any of the remaining area around, we're not aware of any plans for it, or if there are plans, they've not been brought up to me. Um, most of my discussions with the city of Charlottetown have been if this specific site, not only because it is a demonstration site, but also just because it's a particularly vulnerable spot along that area. Um, so most of our discussions have revolved around that. Plans for the wider continued area, they just haven't been discussed with us if there are any. So. Okay, Brad? Thanks, I just wanted to follow up. So in, in my experience, um, most uh, landowners and developers I, actually they really do care whether it's altruistic and, and they want to make sure that they protect our waterways, but also just selfish and they want to make sure that they, their land stays where it is, right? Um, uh, so as, as we look at our, our soil erosion uh, you know, measures, I really love your idea of making sure there's a soil erosion plan. I didn't realize there wasn't one, but do you have any expertise in the watershed groups that could lend to a review of the specifications for soil erosion protection right now because it's been raised to me that given the more extreme weather events and things we have there they're not adequate is that something the watershed can provide any input on yep. that yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely we can uh, i can put together a committee and be in touch with you for sure okay Jen chair Another question? Yeah, just to follow up. So I, I've, I've called on the Department of Transportation to review those. And so what I might do is, is I will pass it on to them that they need to consult with the Watershed Alliance and Watershed Groups um, and to make sure they, they, they get your input into any new, uh, any changes to the specifications of soil erosion measures. Peter Baffin-Baker. Uh, your first recommendation was for the establishment of funding partnerships with islanders um, to create living shorelines. Do you have a sense of, um, of course it would depend on the uptake, but so maybe a better question, let me put it this way, the relative cost of protection when we're talking about living shorelines versus hard armoring per foot or however you measure that? Come on, and it's a tricky question because honestly it is very dependent on the site and what you're planning on doing because when we say living shorelines that can mean a huge range of things it can be as simple as uh, acquiring trees and shrubs and plants and something that's fairly cost effective and low on the landowners or it can be something as complex as this photo we have up here which involved uh, working with um, Island Coastal and the Department of Transportation to remove previous infrastructure to uh, use large uh, construction equipment to uh, put in <coughs> new structures and it was quite uh, labor intensive and, and would be quite costly otherwise so you're looking at anything from you know a low intervention site might be 
know, maybe only $500, $1,000 of plants, depending on how large it is, or it could be something as costly as 50000 if you're doing a quite uh, intensely designed, uh, constructed site. So it, it depends on what resources the landowner might have available. It might depend on what their land looks like, what kind of interventions they want. Um, it's unfortunately just until you know exactly where and what you want to do, in terms of cost, it's just the range is just so wide that there's really no way to, in advance, give people numbers. Did follow up questions? Sure. Okay. Uh, well, can I ask then um, whether you have a dollar figure in mind for this new program um, availability? Like, uh, uh, nice to nice to have uh, <laughs> some recommendations to go back to the legislature. Yeah, I'm, and you know, I've been in talks with um, some people from the provincial staff. Um, we work really closely with them, and. Um, I think for a while, Charlotte and I were fielding at least a call a day about living shoreline. So we know there is mm. a desire yeah, for it. Sure. There's a need for it. She's done plenty of on-site visits on this. And what that looks like, I don't know. Um, they're Because of the fact that they're site-specific, um, I think that you would have great uptake on this. Um, but I wouldn't have an idea what funding would look like at this time. OK. Okay, uh, Juliana. You, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. We're we're starting to wind down. We still have a little one more item on our agenda, new business. But I, uh, yeah. if anybody else has a question, uh, Peter, one more. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate that. Um, last week we had a presenter in here who I think he put it that we're there are some challenging public policy conversations ahead, <laughs> and you've alluded to that. I think retreat was the word that maybe Charlotte used at one point. Um, do you have any thoughts on restrictions on de future development? You said, okay, we, we have to live with what we have. But thoughts from a watershed point of view on restricting development in certain parts of the province? Yes, absolutely. The coast, um, I, I know Janice Harper has, has presented um, on, on things of this nature. Um, of just changing how, um, just simple wording, but yeah, you need to set back. There shouldn't be any hard armoring allowed, and um, there should be mandatory green belts uh, on these coasts um, because I don't, there is no silver bullet, and I don't know that, and it's a hard conversation to have, but nature is dynamic. This is historic. We, we think in such small time frames, and th we, we just have to give let people know that we just can't think like that anymore and that we're very, very sorry that we did. <laughs> but there's not a lot other than nature needs space to move. And we're not going to, we can't do anything about the next superstorm. OK, Juliana, um, that was a good note to end on, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good that you guys are thinking about restriction developments and really good you guys having this conversation. As Heather mentioned, we love partnerships. But having a room where you have different expertise, when you have engineers, when you have Biologists, you have dermatologists, like you have a community, you have people that live in the area. You have the best one thing that would be really beneficial for the island to have this, as you mentioned, Mr. Hilton, have um, the expertise in the room. Like now you need to look elsewhere out of island to have the knowledge to construct a living shoreline or any kind of protection, not armory, but any kind of protection that is a natural based solution. So having a group for the watershed groups or just have a group that expert and have different knowledge, have a, that concise expertise in the room that could provide support for the islanders, that could be your budget where you can know such a specific and you can have a better idea what the problems you're dealing with. I think that would be my personal opinion too. Like create our own capacity on, on island that we know our own um, challenge. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I just have a very quick presentation on that. I, I, that was such well, a Chair, powerful... we are going to be into the time we get to our new business. We're going to be into 12.30 here. And, and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and we may also have to have a very quick recess if that's the okay. so case. I'll give, give you the question, but maybe seconds. a short recess. 15 seconds to ask me the okay. question. Um, I understand that we have existing um, structures that need to be protected, and some of that is done with hard armoring. Just to be absolutely clear, you said no hard armoring. You're talking about for all future coastline developments, your recommendation is no hard armoring? Heather speaking, incorrect. Okay. 
Thanks, Chair. That's I pretty clear. Okay. Clear. Okay. I want to thank the uh, Watershed Alliance coming up, and I, I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't identify there's uh, four watersheds in my riding that uh, impact the riding, and I think we are 100 percent covered, and uh, uh, the, and they all do take very different approaches yeah. to what they're, and, and I think that's one of the beauties of our watersheds that they uh, do choose different things. If I think Harmony Beaver management is quite an issue because it's more prevalent there, and if I go with the West Point, yeah. dune replenishment was quite an issue for them, and they were focused a lot on that, where you've got uh, uh, Trout Unlimited is more focused on habitat uh, enhancements and, yes. and whatnot and trail development, and then Lot 11 is a, another one that's more on public awareness and engagement on how to uh, understand the impacts of what any impact is on the environment. So so I think that's one of the things I would really encourage. So I, when Hilton makes the comment that we should do some uh, maybe some expertise, I think that's good. You, you, every watershed isn't going to have that expertise, and, and uh, uh, how do you, else do you get it if that does something become an issue in your particular watershed. So anyway, I want to thank you very much, and we're going to take a very quick recess <laughs> and try to get back here in a couple of minutes because we do have uh, some new business to discuss. Thank you. Thank you. Convene. Uh, Susie is an observing member, so we don't necessarily have to have her right here at the moment. But uh, uh, our next item on the agenda is new business. Does anybody have any new business they want to bring up? Uh, I do have actually one thing that I'd like to bring up, and I've had some calls, and it may impact a bit on Hilton as far as uh, the aquaculture industry uh, and uh, Fiona uh, relief funding and things of that nature. Um, there's been tremendous delays from Red Cross, and I think a lot of the, the uh, aquaculture industry is getting rather frustrated. And uh, also just that the process of, you know, here we are into uh, well past a year past Fiona, and uh, yet some decisions haven't been made, and some decisions have been, but then they were told you weren't, you weren't eligible. 
So now these people now have to start back right from square one, and they don't know whether to, to buy oyster seed in or not. Uh, they're not going to be compensated. How much should they buy? There's a lot of issues around that, that issue. So uh, although our timelines are very limited to what we're going to be able to do, I, I might suggest, though, that I'd like to see us as a committee write a letter to maybe Red Cross to get an update on uh, the uh, relief funding that, uh, that they've, uh, you know, where they're at in their process of getting these decisions made. I, I don't know how much information we get, but I don't know are they at the last of their, <laughs> their list of 3,000 applications, or are they halfway through yet? Uh, and uh, is there anything that could be done to expedite some decision making, at least for those that are ineligible, so they can make some decisions? So there's a lot of them sitting there and not knowing. So anyway, I just want to throw that out there to the committee. Brad Trivers, you have some comments? Well, thanks for raising that, because uh, I have... I have several constituents in exactly that situation. Okay. You know, one that had greenhouses and they lost this growing season and they may lose next growing season. And all they want is a decision, <laughs> right? <laughs> just how much, it's been 13 months, I just want to know am I going to get it or not. They really think they're eligible, but, uh, and then I have another dairy farm, and you know, again, just, because they know they can't spend the money ahead of time, otherwise they will be ineligible. They won't get any mm. funds back. So I agree wholeheartedly with that. Yeah, yeah. So I say I have been frustrated with uh, just the fact that there's not a lot of accountability to Red Cross on this issue. But uh, and we can't get answers. But maybe our committee is awake to write letters. So Peter Bevan Baker, some comments. Hundred percent with everything you both said, except I would like to go directly to having representatives from Red Cross in here to talk about it because I know that the letter will just delay the inevitable. I have so many questions I would like to well, ask a, a Red Cross representative. So. <laughs> Clerk, do, do we have any availability <laughs> as we move forward? I mean, we can certainly make that effort to try to get, uh, get a, a, an appointment uh, or have them come in and present. Uh, I, I would love that too. I just, I guess I was more concerned about the timelines and at least if we had something that would be better than, than uh, just letting it sit there again. Uh, so, Clerk, give uh, us an update. Unfortunately, I don't have an update. As I'm not the regular committee <laughs> clerk, I'm not sure what the calendar for this committee looks like moving forward, but I can pass it on to the regular committee clerk and they can try to find out a time. Um, is this committee open to times outside of... We, we have said that we would, yeah. Okay. So I, I guess maybe you could inform Alicia yes. uh, to sort of say, this is something we would like to... Uh, we will write a letter and ask for a presentation. <laughs> and uh, uh, for her to try to work and see if she can schedule something uh, in light of uh, her, if she's finding that's becoming very difficult, maybe just if, if she could ask them to provide us an update on where they're at with their uh, application process and approval process. Uh, everybody in a kind of an agreement to that? I mean, it's to do the best we can with uh, what we got. And, uh, you know, Samantha's doing a great job of filling in here, but it's probably a lot to ask her to, to pick a date and a time, but we'll ask Alicia to do that. Uh, yeah. Brad Trivers? Do you have a list of, of dates? I know we have uh, well, we some get, caucus yeah. meetings, like October 25th and October 26th. Uh, people from the government member's office will not be available. I There's, think we've already encountered already that because we were dealing okay, with the good. beef plant issue there. For okay, a okay bit, good. Right? Just so, wanted to make sure so you we're aware of that. that. But good. Um, anyway, so I guess the point being, we, we, we are, are in agreement as a committee that there's an issue there that we're, we want to get some answers out of Red Cross and we'll allow the latitude of our clerk to uh, try to find the best way to do that and our preference would be a, a in-person uh, presentation. Okay? Any other new business? Okay, hearing none, ask for an adjournment. Moved by Peter Bevan Baker. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.